I think we can start. Uh, good morning, dear participants. Welcome to session 6A. My name is Bedr Özer. I am from Turkey, Fırat University, which is in Turkey. I am the chair of this session. Uh, the session topics are system engineering and computer technology. We have five uh, presentation in this session. Uh, the first uh, presentation title is Fast Statical Image Binarization of Color Images for the Recognition of QR Codes. The presenter is Mr. Okarma from Poland. We invite him. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> well, the presentation is related strictly to image processing and image analysis. Uh, to be uh, exact, uh, the main topic is uh, the binarization, which is an important step of many image recognition and analysis applications. Uh, I have focused with my co-author, Piotr Lech, is my colleague from the same department, uh, we work for the Faculty of <laughs> Electrical Engineering uh, in West Pomeranian University of Technology in Szczecin. It, it's northwestern part of Poland, 150 kilometers from Berlin. We are closer to Berlin, Copenhagen and Prague than our capital Warsaw. It's <coughs> I think it could be interesting for some of you. <coughs> Well, we have focused on the binarization of color natural images for the recognition of quick response codes, which are, we know, they are not safe, yeah, after <laughs> yesterday's <laughs> um, uh, first session, but uh, they are very useful, especially, especially for mobile devices. Uh, uh, so, as you probably know, the main idea of two-dimensional QR codes is the quick response. So the recognition of such codes should be fast. Uh, as we know that some, in some cases uh, we have the natural images which can be illuminated in various ways, uh, which can be just color. They are not necessarily only black and white, uh, sometimes we just have to localize the QR code and analyze the whole image in order to find the place where the code, code is located and then to m make a binarization in such a way that the quick response code could be properly recognized. So the binarization, it would be good if it could be fast as well. So. I will discuss some problems uh, in binary codes recognition, meaning the two-dimensional codes, as the example the QR codes, because there are some other uh, systems of coding, uh, Aztec for example, uh, I will briefly discuss the idea and experimental results going to the conclusions. Well, so. Um, We cannot imagine uh, contemporary mobile devices without the camera, without the ability to recognize the quick response codes. So it's just a sign of times we have the access to such technology. But we would like to decode the text information as fast as possible. It's stored in binary two dimensional array, but. Uh, <coughs> Good <coughs> news is that uh, there are practically no chance to decode the quick response code wrongly. We decode it well, or we do not decode uh, uh, the quick response code. Uh, <coughs> the reason is the presence of some additional correction information um, using the read Solomon's code, which preserve 
the integrity of data. So uh, even if we try to estimate something, uh, we can try just try to make attempt to recognition. Is it suc successful or not? Yeah, it is impossible to almost impossible to decode it wrongly. So, of course, two-dimensional codes are uh, more and more popular in various applications. Uh, for commercial purposes, we can find it almost everywhere. Uh, but uh, if we consider it, it as a reliable and useful technology, we should remember that it is very useful when we can predict quite good lighting conditions and generally, let's say, good quality of the input image. Yeah? There is not a problem to recognize such code, but the problem could be related to code localization, where is the code in the big image. This is the first problem, and the second problem is how to uh, binarize the natural image in order to preserve the necessary information. So, the nature of data is binary, but the cameras do not work in binary mode. So, we have the, the color image as the input. So, the first step should be conversion to grayscale and then to the binary form. It can be done in various ways because we can apply uh, different color spaces, different, different methods of color to gray conversion uh, and various binarization algorithms. So I will present some illustrations about the influence of the color space and the color to grayscale and further binarization algorithm on the readability of such two-dimensional codes. Of course, if the images are poorly illuminated, if they contain some distortions, maybe geometrical, maybe related to contrast color, uh, if they are dirty, the dirt could not necessarily be black in the color image, but if the, the, if the dirt is also dark, it could be black after the binarization, so the recognition could be at least troublesome. So, in such a case, uh, if we have a natural image, especially captured somewhere outside in open air <coughs> conditions with unknown lighting conditions, we could have a problem. Uh, and remembering that the quick response should be quick. Sometimes we just have no time. If you have installed on your mobile phone the QR reader or some similar applications, sometimes you just use the phone, try to scan and, and just try. It doesn't work always. Yeah, sometimes it just doesn't work. Uh, the reason is uh, the illumination. For example, imagine the QR code printed on the glass. It's extremely hard to recognize for such devices, yeah? Uh, because uh, the glass is transparent and the proper recognition depends on what is behind the glass, yeah? So, <clears throat> we have proposed uh, the application of fast image binarization applying the statistical sampling, statistical experiment. To be honest, it's the Monte Carlo based method. For color images, we apply the various color spaces, various histogram based uh, binarization algorithms with uh, the use of such acceleration in order to verify um, the influence of the color model, influence the, of the binarization and the results are quite interesting, I, as I think. Uh, in order to ver verify uh, the usefulness and the validity of the proposed uh, method, uh, we used MATLAB environment as usually, uh, but we 
have installed this ZBar binary code reader. It's cross cross-platform freeware uh, solution, uh, which can be called from MATLAB, for example. Uh, and we conducted some experiments for uh, various images, uh, natural images. Uh, so if we tried to recognize the codes directly without any preprocessing, without without binarization, just from color images, it not always led to success. Uh, in many situations we have obtained in some preliminary experiments much better results, much better recognition accuracy uh, after changing the color model, after the conversion <coughs> to grayscale and after the further binarization. So the first conclusion is that the input image should be binary. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so which color model should be used? We'll see. Uh, and we should also remember about the computational complexity. As I can say for the fourth time, quick response should be quick. So if we have a fast conversion method from RGB to any other color space, if it's just a linear conversion, uh, like in television, for example, and uh, YUV color model, for example, okay, it's fast. But if we convert uh, the color image into the grayscale using some more sophisticated algorithms or using nonlinear conversion of color spaces, for example, as in LIB color model, it's more time consuming. So maybe it could be better to try to make a fast conversion, try to recognize the code. If it doesn't go to success, then we use some slower methods, yeah? So, even if the conversion is quite slow, we can accelerate the next step of binarization. Our idea is to, to reduce the complexity of the binarization part of the application using the Monte Carlo method, because we can save a lot of time, uh, especially for high resolution images where the code is relatively small, but we have to process the, the whole image before the localization of the code. The localization is a separate problem. We haven't discussed uh, it exactly in the paper. So what is the idea? Uh, we, draw some, we draw a number of pixels. Uh, sorry for formatting, I don't know why. Uh, but we mm, draw a number of pixels relatively small. So if we have a 10 megapixels image, we draw just 100 pixels, maybe maybe 200, maybe 50 pixels. Uh, we generate them randomly. It is important that such uh, samples should be equally distributed in the whole image. Yeah? So if we use uh, the random number generator, generator with uniform distribution uh, applying for the two-dimensional image, uh, we can estimate the histogram, but not for the whole image, processing 10 megapixels, yeah? But only for drawn 100 or 200 pixels. We estimate the histogram, remembering that binarization, histogram-based binarization methods use the histogram only uh, for uh, determining the threshold. So if we determine the threshold <coughs> basing on the simplified histogram representation, we obtain very, very similar result, but much faster. I will show you some uh, examples. Uh, so, we just draw a limited number of samples from the whole distributed, from the whole image and analyze the histogram of them. So, then, such simplified histogram can be the input data for OTS or CAP or ROSIN algorithms, all 
histogram based uh, very popular binarization methods so we save a lot of time because we do not have to count all the pixels which belong to each luminance level we just count the drawn pixels very very strongly limited number of them so if we verify such influence of color space sometimes it's hard to find the color code for example but they are available if we search on the internet we can um, we can find very surprising images of QR codes uh, which are sometimes quite hard for recognize but it's possible to recognize them so if we applied the Monte Carlo method for such different resolution uh, images we can draw even 20 pixels and obtain a good result so those are the exemplary images here yeah? totally different sometimes color they are all natural images just captured by the video camera publicly available so uh, sometimes we have the problem because uh, the QR code could be partially occluded sometimes uh, it could be hard because uh, the neighborhood of the QR code has the influ influence on the binarization sometimes it's not equally uh, illuminated so trying to binarize the image as a whole and try to recognize the code without the localization because the localization of the co uh, QR code directly on the color image is not necessarily fast yeah? if you have an ap application in the mobile phone you can try to fill the area with the code in order to simplify the recognition yeah? so if we take just a re red channel from the image we are unable to see any code because it was red yeah uh, if we take the same image but the green color uh, green channel okay everything seems to look good example of blue but example of x in xyz the code looks dirty we would be unable to recognize it properly yeah in some other color spaces if we use the value just the <coughs> brightness information from HSV color model we lose the code if we use Y for example for this image those are only examples yeah uh, we can lose the part of information yeah so we should be uh, we should take care about uh, about uh, the proper color model yeah uh, those are the results <coughs> of uh, binarization using Otsu method with for for limited number of samples using the Monte Carlo method for threshold estimation and the results are also different because for different number of samples quite low depending on the color space which is used for color to grayscale conversion before the binarization we obtain <coughs> uh, different results yeah those images are different maybe they would be recognized maybe not those images of the same image yeah are totally uh, dirty for recognizing yes so we have very different uh, very different situations uh, well sometimes using only 20, pic 20 samples we obtain much better results than using 1000 samples yeah so the number of samples could be low okay so trying to recognize for for example images natural of course uh, 256 levels of gray this image couldn't be properly recognized by the Z bar software in any color space. We have 
all the minuses there. So such an image cannot be properly recognized in the grayscale or in the any of color channels. If we obtain, if we conduct the binarization, it leads to success. So we can apply the Otsu or Kapur method for full image. Using the Otsu method, success is almost everywhere. For Kapur method, uh, not always. For six channels, okay, properly recognized code. For four of them, no. But applying the Monte Carlo method for different number of samples, we can observe, for example, <coughs> Otsu method for 200 <coughs> of samples. Success is always even for Z. Okay, not always. It depends on sampling. It depends on, it's random. But even if it's random, if it's fast, we can try to determine five different thresholds using five experiments. We have a lot of time. It's very fast. So we can try to recognize the five images in parallel. If it's fast, okay, one of them will be okay. We know that if we have the text data, it's okay. If we do not have the text data after the, after the decoding of the QR code, okay, we failed. But we know if we have success or not. So even if we conduct the recognition five times, one success is enough. We know which one is it, yeah? So, for another image, the red one, yeah? Well, success in blue and Z channels, they are similar to each other. Uh, after the binarization for some of the channels, yeah? But quite similar results, sometimes even in some other color spaces, can be obtained mm, for some other color spaces, yeah, which are useless for full image binarization. Another idea, quick response code, uh, successes for grayscale, some successes for Monte Carlo method. It was quite hard because a lot of neighboring pixels are very similar, so if we draw such dark pixels, they uh, will influence the threshold. So sometimes for the blue channel, using Otsu, uh, fast binarization, we can also recognize the code. And another quite uh, strange image without the margins. It's wrong, it's very hard for uh, for the recognition. Uh, we also have some successes for uh, the color channels, binarized. Uh, for such um, color channels uh, which haven't led to the success for grayscale or full image binarization. So, well, we verified that uh, there is a strong influence of the color model on the recognition accuracy of the QR codes, uh, but we, ha we also verified the usefulness of the fast uh, binarization in various color spaces. Of course, uh, the number of randomly chosen pixels can be reduced dramatically, uh, but even if we do not obtain the result, we can repeat the procedure and draw once again. Uh, it's just the cost of the randomness. Uh, okay, so one additional remark. For such an image, it's very, very hard for recognition. Uh, but sometimes, 
if we apply block-based binarization, so the binarization using the Monte Carlo also method, yeah, if it would be more local, sometimes, depending on draws, we can obtain something like this. So the binarization thresholds would be different. So part of the image could be treated as negative in the sense of background, yeah? If for some parts, we have four blocks there, yeah? So if for some parts of the image, uh, the background will be white, and for some other black, we can treat it as the margins. So, due to simplified localization of the code, the recognition of such encode is possible. But there are no chances to recognize this one, although it uh, looks quite good yeah, for us, but not for the algorithm. So, mm, to conclude, of course, we know that the results are dependent on the number of samples. Uh, sometimes it would be necessary to uh, make the repetition of drawing, but the proof of method is fast. Uh, we can binarize the images very fast. Uh, even for high resolution of the image, especially a natural image acquired uh, in different lighting conditions, we can check several possible color representations and try to uh, make a fast conversion, try to binarize and recognize the code. If it, there will be no success, we can repeat the procedure for the other color space. Of course, remembering that the available hardware now or in a few years mm, will uh, mm, give us a chance of parallel processing, we can make a parallel implementation of uh, the method, converting the image into par in parallel into, for example, four different color spaces, conduct four binarization, and if we obtain four results of decoding in parallel, one of them is enough. If we have a success with the Ritz Solomon code, it's enough. Yeah? We only need to find a single color space and a single binarization method uh, which will allow the proper <coughs> recognition for us. Okay, thank you for your attention. Feel free thank to you. ask thank questions. Any question? Uh, I ask, I wonder which method did you use for PC the random number generator? It's just MATLAB's built-in generator. MATLAB's function? Yeah, it's MATLAB function with uniform distribution. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Prior to binarization, or to do binarization, then localization, and when picture is localized, then to do uh, yeah. a better binarization? Localization is another problem, but uh, yeah, there are sometimes there are some different methods. If we try to localize the uh, QR code on, to, on the color image, uh, we can use, for example, the color histograms and we should analyze the variance and if we find a place where the distribution of colors is two model, B model, yeah, we have only black and white, so high variance, uh, there is a possible QR code, but uh, it's before the binarization, yeah? But it's quite time consuming because we should uh, analyze the local histograms, yeah? Of course, we could try to estimate the histograms using the Monte Carlo method. Yeah, we could try, but it, it's not as easy as for binarization because 
if we have a limited number of samples, uh, we have very limited information. So histogram doesn't look the same. Uh, maybe it could be useful, but threshold <coughs> is very similar, yeah? But only the threshold, yeah? Uh, but uh, if we try to analyze the variance, for example, it could be quite different, yeah? So uh, it is possible, but time consuming. So after the binarization, it's much easier, yeah? It's much faster, yeah? Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Okarma. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The second presentation title is uh, Laser Scanner Calibration Dependency. Mr. Mulder from Estonia. I'm from Tallinn University of Technology and I'm going to talk about laser scanner calibration dependency on the laser line detection method. Uh, I will start with an introduction, uh, then I will continue with the basics of the laser scanner and why the calibration is needed. Uh, then how we determine the laser light plane parameters with pixel and sub-pixel laser line detection methods and then some results and conclusions. Uh, in 3D laser scanners, uh, calibration is needed in order to convert the pixels in camera to real-world units. And this is done using simple triangular transform and, uh, but uh, also uh, during the calibration process, uh, different kinds of uh, distortions are corrected. Uh, uh, distortions caused by the lens optics, <coughs> but uh, also uh, distortions that actually the laser lines are actually rarely straight. Uh, this is also caused by the optics uh, used in front of the laser beam. Many uh, 3D laser scanner calibration methods exist, but uh, all of those methods use uh, laser line detection as part of the calibration process. And therefore, calibration accuracy is uh, directly dependent on the uh, laser line detection method and the resolution of the <coughs> laser line detection method. Uh, by knowing that uh, laser light uh, forms a proper laser light uh, plane uh, and the laser line is located on the on this laser light plane we can find the laser line position in the camera coordinate system uh, from this we can calculate the real position of the laser line in in real world units uh, in order to find the laser light plane parameters, we have used a uh, uh, method where we used uh, uh, chess ports and we used uh, different poses of the chess ports. And by knowing the camera intrinsic parameters uh, and uh, the chess port size, uh, we can calculate the extrinsic parameters of the chess port, uh, which are the rotation <coughs> and the translation vectors of the chess box <coughs> and we know that these laser lines are located on these chess boards so uh, we can uh, calculate the uh, uh, real locations of these uh, laser lines on those chess boards uh, in order to see how the uh, laser line detection uh, method or the resolution of the laser line detection method influences the <coughs> end results. Uh, we have uh, found these uh, laser lines with two methods. First with pixel resolution method from the chessboard and also with a sub-pixel resolution. 
For the pixel resolution method, we used uh, 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 Gaussian distribution convolution, and uh, and also for the for the subpixel resolution, we used also the Gaussian convolution, but uh, we improved it with a uh, parabola, uh, finding the more accurate uh, location of the convolution uh, top. So. Uh, in the calibration process, uh, we have found with the two methods of these uh, laser light plane parameters. Uh, here you can see the results that we gained with uh, different image sets. Uh, this is with a pixel resolution laser line detection method and also the uh, subpixel resolution laser line detection method. Uh, the changes of the parameters are quite small. But the biggest, uh, biggest uh, variation is the parameter A, uh, which is actually the rotation uh, of the laser light plane. And in order to see how the actual measurement results are influenced by the laser line detection resolution in the calibration process, uh, we use two objects to measure the uh, actual measurements. Uh, here is an example of the input image that we used. It's taken from around two meter height. Uh, there are two objects. One is six mi millimeters in height, and the other one is 25 millimeters in height. And here is a bigger image uh, of these objects uh, uh, zoomed in. And uh, from the measurement image, the laser line is uh, detected with subpixel resolution. So the only uh, the time uh, when the uh, method is changed is in the calibration process. Uh, here is the results that we get with both methods. As you can see, the uh, object's uh, heights are quite uh, accurate, but there is some deviation between the subpixel resolution and the pixel resolution image. And from this image, you can see it more clearly. It's a smaller object, and you can see that there is a deviation between these uh, measurement results with pixel and subpixel resolution. Uh, we found out that uh, the, the difference uh, between the measurements is quite systematic with different image sets, uh, and uh, it was minus one to 1.2 millimeters deviation across the whole laser line image in our current experiments. This is uh, quite a big uh, deviation if we are talking about uh, sub-millimeter measurements. And uh, then we uh, uh, calculated the real uh, height of the objects. Uh, and the standard deviation of the of the measurements, and uh, of course we saw that uh, the the uh, results with uh, pixel uh, subpixel uh, resolution in the calibration process gave us more accurate results, but uh, it's a matter of trade-off between the complexity of the laser line uh, detection method and the uh, accuracy of the of the system because in uh, in embedded systems the uh, processor resources are quite limited and uh, maybe it's not worth to uh, to uh, develop such a complicated laser line detection system in order to calibrate the system accurately uh, so for the conclusion we have investigated how the calibration uh, uh, measurement uh, results are dependent of the laser line detection method with pixel and subpixel resolution and uh, we saw that there was quite a uh, big uh, influence uh, we compare the measurement results with uh, reference objects and uh, the deviation was uh, around one was one two plus one point two millimeters in our setup Standard deviation of the measurements was less than 0.5 millimeters, and uh, we found out that actually the subpixel laser line detection method improves the measurement results. But again, uh, if the measurement accuracy is not so important, let's say within a few millimeters, 
then uh, the pixel resolution laser line detection method is okay as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any question? No question. Could you show once again the photo of two objects? Yeah. One moment. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, the camera is located not, uh, probably not exactly at the top. Yeah, so the objects are probably not exactly uh, at the bottom in the same place as, as the camera, yeah? Yes. In my opinion, it's, this is the reason of your uh, uh, this is the systematic error because uh, if you have the object which is located not in the central part, not in the optical axis of the camera, uh, the difference between the lines you can observe changes. Yeah. So if the object is shifted, you will have the systematic change of the line. Yeah. So you will observe the different height. Yeah, in my opinion, it could influence your results. Yeah, not the change between two methods. Yeah, but the shift. That's why you observe five point five centimeters, not six, for example. Yeah? Uh, actually, the uh, uh, these uh, laser plane parameters can are uh, how to say uh, and. After the experimentation, we de decide to use uh, two kilobytes to store the hyperbolic tank and nonlinear function, and the maximum error is uh, less than uh, 0 0.4 percent. Uh, and we work actually at at this point, where it's two kilobytes. The second uh, experimentation uh, was with uh, the transfer function. Here's the urban square error, and uh, we set the uh, neuron to work uh, in narrow as narrow band filter, as uh, half band filter, and as uh, uh, full band uh, uh, filter. And here's the surfaces of uh, error in logarithmic scale. So, here we see uh, the error of transfer function with maximal gain of 16, here, here and here. For full band, half band and narrow band. And uh, there is this line for full band, second line for half band, and uh, for narrow band, this line. So uh, we can see that uh, the narrower the uh, best band is, uh, the, the higher uh, the error of the, of the transfer function on the output. Uh, so Two first uh, conclusion I have mentioned, and we decide to use two kilobytes uh, of memory, achieving uh, 0 0.4 or less uh, the maximum error. And uh, third uh, conclusions after the implementation uh, of the uh, lattice leader neuron with the activation function, we achieved the maximum frequency of. 312 megahertz, which is uh, mm, actually high frequency for the FPGA. Uh, so, thank you for attention. <coughs> Any question? Did I miss the uh, number of bits you used for one output sample? I was saying uh, uh -huh, just okay. the total memory. Yes, we use two bytes for one sample, uh, 60 bits. And um, did you consider like a variation because uh, if you maybe increase number of bits, then you could decrease uh, total memory. So 
Yes, it, it's uh, it's possible, but it's actually trade off of memory and uh, and accuracy. So in uh, uh, in the uh, low memory FPGA, we have only a few kilobytes of memory, so we we just uh, uh, if we decide to use a uh, more precise. Um, uh, more than 16 of the 32 bits, then we must decrease the number of the, the samples. Any question? Thank you. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. The uh, title of my presentation is on the water world band acoustic scattering modeling based on FTDT. This is joint uh, research collaboration between University of Pretoria in South Africa and Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics in China. Actually, first author is supposed to be here and present the uh, paper as it is in the program, but um, they leave the responsibility to me, so I will try my best to present the paper. Outline of presentation is introduction and motivation of this research, FTTD methodology, boundary condition, uh, improved method, which is our proposal, simulation result, and analysis, and we, at the end, we conclude the presentation. As introduction, um, FTTD, or finite difference time domain, was firstly proposed uh, by uh, Yi in 1966, and it used in uh, electromagnetic field. In 1995, there was uh, application of FTTT uh, in room acoustic problems, and after that, we had uh, some progress in uh, to solving this FTTT room acoustic problem in some fields like computational speed, like boundary condition, or uh, near to uh, too far uh, field transformation. In 1996, there was the first proposal uh, regarding application of FTTT uh, in uh, underwater. Uh, acoustic problems and after that we had uh, some proposals, some research works uh, regarding FTTT only to solve the sound wave propagation in shallow water, not the deep water. So what is this advantage of the uh, uh, recent work? The first one is they consider only 2D objects, so they didn't consider like complex objects, uh, like 3D objects. The second one is uh, they didn't consider uh, absorbing uh, uh, boundary condition, which may affect large reflection as well. And uh, as you can see, the, 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 the third one is um, about they use single frequency signal as incident wave, which they consider for analysis, they consider time and space, but not frequency characteristic. So what we are trying to do in our proposal, we're trying to consider time and space and also adding this frequency uh, characteristic to our model. Uh, considering sound wave propagation in underwater, um, the formula of FTTT consists of Euler equation and equation of continuity. As you can see here, we try to divide a uh, computational domain to several degrees, and uh, wh what we can call is the three-dimensional uh, grid geometry by uh, FTTT formula. For example, we have in x direction, y and z, which is a space, and uh, this is the classical FTTT methodology. The, all the formula, they consider time and also the space in x, y, and z and direction. And in this classical FTTT, time uh, must be uh, small enough, as you can see here, to keep uh, stability of the uh, mm, algorithm. Uh, the key to solve acoustic problem with FTTT is to have appropriate boundary model. Uh, if if we, we don't have the uh, like uh, bounded domain and we, if we have unbounded domain, uh, what we must first do is to find appropriate uh, ABC or absorbing boundary condition. Uh, uh, to terminate the computational domain. Otherwise, this computational domain will act as a reflector, uh, which is not a favorite. So uh, to, to find out about the boundary model, we have two models currently, for example, impedance uh, boundary model, which is not target of this research and topic of this research. And the second one is uh, absorbing boundary model. Uh, this absorbing boundary model consists of two other models, subcategories like MUR-ABC, and PMLABC. In the first one, MUR, 
the fact is uh, we have limited reflection in a specific frequency and angle. But in the second one, uh, which we use in our proposal, uh, we, we see this one in our simulation analysis as, as well. Uh, we have fully, uh, 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 completely absorption uh, regardless of any frequency and regardless of any uh, specific angles. Uh, as we discussed, and also is in title of this research, the source wave uh, or incidence wave is void band, is broad band. So uh, what we expect, uh, this uh, will surround all the computational domain. And also we can divide the computational domain to several areas like PML region, which we can also call this one PML buffer. We see the formula of this side in the next slide, and also the interior side. So this is the formula we have for PML uh, buffer, and all in all this formula, we have some uh, coefficient like alpha x, alpha y, and alpha z, uh, which can be called as attenuation coefficient. We use this attenuation co coefficient to uh, modify our proposal. So all the equations that we discussed so far, they are uh, mainly uh, appropriate for homogeneous non-dissipative uh, medium. But in actual and real environment, what we need, th th there are many factors that may affect the sound wave propagation. Uh, for example, when we talk about uh, sound propagation in the sea, the absorption sound mainly depends on uh, the, some mechanism like uh, viscous absorption and molecular thermal uh, relaxation absorption. The fact is, uh, for absorption loss, uh, it mainly depends on the frequency. As you can see, this is the absorption coefficient, which depends on the frequency, and, and this is the formula that we use to modify the, uh, uh, the classical FTDT. And also, the other, on the other side, attenuation coefficient also uh, is, can be expressed as a formula of uh, power law. And here, what we have is this delta R, is a uh, transmission distance, which we can show this transmission distance as a function of time and also a speed. Uh, this is the modified FTDT uh, that we use in our um, uh, research work. We consider here time. We also consider this beta that we previously showed that is function of the frequency. Uh, to, to, to have uh, uh, to divide the computational modeling, we try to use a uh, mesh generator, and we also use computer graphics to generate the mesh, uh, um, uh, mesh generating of the FTDT method. So um, this is an example how we can, for example, to divide this, uh, the model and also the computational the, the, uh, what, uh, the domain that we have. Uh, what we can do is uh, we must have uh, this is the tetrahedron that we have. We must have finite number of this tetrahedron. Uh, each tetrahedron must have three vertices, like A, B, C, uh, and uh, like vertice one, vertice two, and vertice three, which can consist of three, three vertices of the triangle. And also D, another vertice that we can uh, consider this one as center of the model. This P is, uh, can be uh, any point uh, in, this, uh, in the area. So and, uh, we have now uh, four vertices. And if we uh, want to analyze this one, if we consider vertices one, two, and three equal to zero, greater than zero, and only the, the fourth one, which is this one, center of the model, greater than that zero, then we can conclude that P is inside the target model. And uh, the same condition, but if we consider V uh, four, which is again this uh, D center, as a zero, then we can consider that P is inside the surface. And or if all these uh, vertices are equal to zero, we can say that uh, this tetrahedron is not the target, and we must compare the model with another tetrahedron. Uh, simulation analysis, this is the simulation parameters that we use, for example, sound uh, speed in the water and also water density. Uh, what we have here is, we first, we want to uh, justify our approach based on two boundary conditions, which can be um, the first one is based on PML uh, boundary condition, and the second one is based on MUR. In open model, which is this one, uh, sound will come, hit the object, and also penetrate, and then propagate. But based on the second boundary condition that is MUR, we see that we don't have penetration, but uh, 
And also, the, uh, this sound wave doesn't um, hit the object. So we are trying to justify, and based on this uh, uh, result, we can see that um, our boundary condition that uh, is work uh, appropriately. And also, uh, if we consider uh, incident spectrum and scatter um, uh, spectrum, we see that we have some uh, new uh, frequency component, um, which can be based on uh, dispersion of sound uh, propagation. The incident rate that we use is the LFM, uh, linear frequency modulation. The formula is here. This LFM uh, is uh, strong enough um, to interference, multipass, and Doppler shift. That's why we use this uh, LFM as incidence rate. For 2D objects, uh, this is um, black and white we can consider as uh, incident rate. And there are some uh, area gray here. Mm -hmm. We can consider as sound pressure intensity. If we continue the analysis, we see that uh, the, the original object was only consists of one circuit here. But after uh, sound wave come and heat and pro, uh, penetrate into the object, we see now we have uh, more than one uh, circuit. Uh, like for example, here is one, the another one is this side. And here you see there is one circuit and another circuit. So the reason is, um, we have more stickers is because of incidence wave are uh, disappearing. It's like video and sound wave is uh, also disappearing uh, after a while. For complex object, which is 3D object, uh, this is uh, the irregular or complex object that we have. And we try to um, convert this one to based on the mesh generated method that we already discussed. And the incidence wave is in X or uh, Y uh, plane. Um, if you want to consider um, the result in X of Y and X of Z, you see that the object that we considered in the previous slide now is uh, symmetric here. The shadow is symmetric here, but it's not symmetric in X or Z. Um, and also, the, another analysis, we see that if we consider <laughs> distribution of sun pressure, uh, that blind area we cannot see uh, when we consider X or Y, but it's appear here. Uh, when we, uh, we consider um, X or Z plane. And the last uh, analysis that we have is based on waveform that we can conclude the waveform can show us the shape of the object. We can derive the shape of the object based on the waveform that we have. And also we can see that they are symmetric uh, based on wave reaching time, which is like four milliseconds uh, here and four milliseconds in this area. But it's this, in this uh, analysis, that the simulation is that we got is asymmetric. The starting, uh, the reach time is like 1.6 milliseconds. So as a conclusion, we try to modify this FTDT uh, methodology. And also, uh, we use absorption coefficient, which is frequency uh, dependence, to compute broadband acoustic scattering model <coughs> for under, uh, underwater complex objects. And for the simulation result, we got very close to what we can see in the real environment and uh, with high accuracy as well. So for future, when we try to develop the algorithm uh, for uh, calculating the computational of broadband acoustic scattering model in underwater. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. If there is any question, please. Any questions? No, is, this is not for the shallow water. This is for the real water. For the real water. Yeah, this is in the real condition that we use for the submarine. So the proposal actually is approved by uh, submarine department in China and submarine department in South Africa. So this is the real research work. But the previous work is only for the shallow water, like in the river, something like that, for a small object. Thank you. All right. <laughs> the last presentation title is Source Traffic Modeling in WSN for Acoustic Sensing in Reverberant Environment. Mr. Seti from Serbia.
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nenad Cetic. Uh, I'm coming from Serbia, from uh, University of Novi Sad, Faculty of Technical Sciences. And I will present you a paper about uh, source traffic modeling in viral sensor network for acoustical sensing in this reverberant environments or this uh, enclosures with uh, reverberation. So the main motivation behind this uh, research is the, this um, uh, modern consumer electronics environment where we want to put a bunch of sensors in the room and try to uh, make uh, intelligibility about the environment and about uh, uh, to provide an extra features to provide a, a smart uh, kind of place for living. Uh, these embedded res uh, uh, devices are usually coming with uh, low resources, so uh, this is a, a, a sort of a sensor that is connected to, a, to a, um, some processing unit. And we are advocating here that, that these uh, sensors could be uh, connected to a conventional internet network. Uh, and we are trying to, to uh, make a contribution in, in research in this area. Uh, acoustical sensing is traditionally done with these microphone arrays, which are good for uh, defining the, the, the uh, sources and localization of, of the sound using uh, 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 ray forming and, and uh, better technologies of course microphone grids where you have a, a 2D sets of uh, things but uh, when you want to really do a, a, a better way of, of things you we think that uh, these sensors should be wirelessly uh, connected so that you can place them uh, in your environment without any uh, boundaries. Uh, problem with the conventional internet network is this best effort service that did not guaranteeing uh, any quality uh, of service in respect of, of uh, uh, transform, especially with the wireless uh, communication. So we are trying to make a contribution on how to actually analyze this uh, using simulation. What we consider here is a RTP protocol, real-time protocol for uh, transferring the data. And uh, in a combination with this uh, IEEE uh, 1588, uh, it could be used to uh, temporarily synchronize uh, uh, sensors so that you can have a, a good temporary resolution uh, and correlation between sensors. Uh, a lot of uh, work is, is currently done with this uh, IoT, which is uh, Internet of Things, and it's sort of a vibrant uh, researching scene which uh, has a lot of researchers and contributors. Also, uh, we're uh, having uh, uh, in mind that uh, cloud computing can do uh, here, so uh, that's why we're trying to stream uh, audio from uh, s sensors to some processing unit which can be really dislocated or even in the cloud. Uh, so we are trying to, to uh, make a contribution to that. And, and this is uh, mainly the, the need for this additional research. So our idea is to try to uh, make a new traffic model. So this is uh, going to be a new uh, source traffic model to be more precise. Uh, and we have a, a focus in reverberant environment, uh, <coughs> such as small room and, and, and enclosures that are uh, applicable to a, you know, sort of a living space. Uh, we will uh, use a, a image source model. We will see what it, that is in a minute for the sound propagation modeling. And uh, we are analyzing uh, properties of, of, of the VSM before this is applied. So this is only a MATLAB simulation, uh, but we will see how we actually verify this with a, with a real uh, room in a, in a real uh, scenario. So basically the, the presentation overview will give us uh, a little bit about acoustical sensing. Uh, we are, we'll discuss the sound propagation problem and, and uh, this uh, giving a, a little bit of a 
image source modeling calculus. Uh, then we are uh, presenting our uh, sensor model, so we have a, a little bit of, a, of a research and an idea on how to uh, do these sensors uh, in software. And uh, uh, we will discuss experimental results and, and glance at the over the related work that is done on this subject and finally conclude and give uh, some general remarks. Uh, acoustic sensing uh, is uh, in constant contrast with uh, different sensing. Uh, it's usually a non-line of sight type of a sensing, so it, it is enough for you to have a one sensor in, in the room and you can even sense something behind a pole or, or behind a corner because of the sound propagation. So it's, it is really convenient uh, for a lot of application and, and, and multiple uh, purpose sensing could be done with, with such a thing. But this multi-purpose is, is, is where we see the majority of problem because uh, processing and heavy processing cannot be really done in place in, in, in your uh, sensor. Uh, because it could be uh, uh, time and, and energy consuming. So uh, we are advocating this, this approach where the, the sound is actually transferred to a, a bigger unit and then process either trying to be processed in real time or on doing the offline analysis. So uh, this is also connected with this uh, wireless uh, multimedia sensor network. So these are uh, sensor networks that are trying to transfer video or audio. Uh, but also acoustic sensing is, is uh, stuff that is usually uh, having all sorts of applications like uh, hearing aids uh, can be a wireless sensor network. Basically your two uh, uh, hearing aids could transfer uh, uh, sound between them and, and try to enhance uh, your so sound experience. Also, hands-free telephony, the, the stuff that you do with the sensors on your desk and trying to make a conference room, things like this, with the, uh, that are just sitting there in a table and picking the, the, the voice. Uh, a lot of uh, possibility to do acoustic monitoring, surveillance, uh, environment uh, uh, assessment or, or the classification, uh, for instance. Uh, where you apply this to outdoors and uh, there are uh, certain projects dealing with, with the classification of, of uh, 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 different vehicles to, on, on a highway and stuff like that. Also when you try to do a presence detection you can apply it to a uh, modern smart house and, and, uh, and uh, smart grid so to uh, make a better energy efficiency. Uh, and a lot uh, of this could be in integrated with a, with a, with a extra artificial intelligence and to make a, this ambient intelligence. So sound and acoustic sensing can help with that. Uh, of course, distributed sensors are better than, than the grids or arrays because they are uh, specially uh, distributed so you can have an extra information, but you actually need to know where uh, each of these sensors uh, is to actually use that information. For the sound propagation model, we use uh, image source model. This is a, an old technique uh, proposed by Alan and Barclay in 1979. Uh, the basic idea is that you uh, model your enclosure and then uh, create an images of this enclosure indefinite in all uh, dimensions. This is 2D case, of course, but it can also be applied in, in 3D. Uh, so basically, this is our uh, source of the sound, and we are modeling it. Uh, we are modeling this wall with the sources or the reflected source here and here and here and here and etc. So basically, when you do a, a modeling like this, you are multiplying the, the sources to uh, get a reflection or reverberation effect and you sum up everything in, in, a, in a point somewhere where your sensor is. So we'll, we'll see that in a minute. This technique is good for and really simple for rectangular shapes and, and usual uh, uh, living space. 
Uh, it is also possible to do with uh, uh, non-convex enclosure, but mathematics is uh, a little bit complex, like a room like this, <laughs> for instance. And uh, the in a recent work, this Eric uh, Lehman proposed a fast uh, image source model, which we are using in, in this work and relying on some of the implementations also in, in MATLAB for uh, coming from Eric. So this is the image source model in calculus. We are using Cartesian coordinate system to describe where our sources and, and sensors are. And we have a, a room dimension uh, uh, there in the vector. Uh, we are having this uh, triplet sum to, to actually uh, model our room uh, and, and uh, doing all the parameters in all the directions. So what, what is the main uh, 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 part of the, of the transfer function H here, which is a really uh, uh, impulse response from a room? It's the actual attenuation coming from the uh, enclosure and the delay of, of the sound propagation uh, with this uh, uh, delay that, that, is, this, that is defined uh, over here. So basically, when we have uh, attenuation and delay for each of the images, then we sum all this up and, and uh, have our uh, transform function. Uh, actual attenuation uh, is modeled by this reflection and, and absorption coefficients, or uh, you actually define either alpha or beta, so that uh, you can do this, this transformation over here. Uh, what's the uh, the catch is that this is, for instance, uh, your left wall, this is right wall, this is your back wall, this is uh, a front wall, and this is a ceiling and, and, and a floor. So you, you're modeling absorption of all the enclosures and you can have uh, even a homogeneous uh, uh, space uh, defined like this. Uh, we are then uh, defining this this uh, distance between the source and and, uh, and the actual sensor, and and using this diagonal matrix, and to be more efficient and and to to actually speed up our calculation, uh, not to do it in in, in a time domain like this, we use actually a, a frequency domain, so a little bit of a modified uh, calculus to do. Um, uh, 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 frequency domain uh, mm -hmm. room uh, impulse response. Uh, then when we want to uh, do a simulation of this room with this uh, uh, ESM method, we are uh, applying a uh, source signal here and do an uh, uh, FFT of that and do a uh, uh, frequency domain convolution here and then we have our uh, convoluted uh, 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 source uh, uh, of the sound to get uh, a real time domain. We just use a uh, inverse uh, fast Fourier transformation to get the actual transform uh, signal or, or transform sound. Next is our sensor uh, model. So we are here proposing a little bit of a, a intelligence in the sensor, not to send data where there is no uh, acoustic event. So this is a simple acoustic sensor with a noise gate. And uh, this is uh, a definition of, of a sensor. Basically, we are uh, modeling our, our signals having the, the uh, single of interest plus some noise, either environmental noise or noise coming uh, from the actual imperfection of, of the sensor, so it, it could be that your microphone is, is uh, not really flat, so we're having the, the uh, consideration that these sensors sh should be uh, really uh, cost efficient, so you don't have to use uh, uh, really sophisticated uh, uh, microphones in the technology. And this algorithm is basically energy-based uh, operating on on the blocks of, of samples so that we 
can have a, a really straightforward implementation and, and, and uh, use a, a less uh, computational power. Uh, first, we are trying to estimate a noise floor or the environment in, in the actual sensor, and this is considered as a, as a sensor calibration. We are operating on uh, M uh, samples to do a, a calibration. Uh, then we are trying to uh, do the, the, the same thing with, uh, with calculating this mean square value for the real signal uh, and uh, do a, sun, uh, uh, a signal to noise ratio or, or this uh, estimated signal energy to uh, background uh, signal energy and apply a simple algorithm like this where we compare the SNR to a SNR threshold and if we are above the threshold, we are transmitting the data or uh, we have an identity function here. But if our, we are below uh, the threshold, we just don't send the data, so, so we consider it's, it's complete silence. Uh, in effect, this is the example of what this uh, sensor will do. When we have a, a time domain in our, our, our uh, sound, like this, uh, depending on, on the uh, energy of, of uh, the actual uh, sound wave, uh, you will have your silences and actual acoustical event uh, differences and uh, this is the line showing where the noise gate is open and when it's closed. When we look at, at, at this uh, other diagram, this is basically this the staircase is where we produce data. So this is the amount of data produced over time. So we just try not to produce uh, any uh, traffic when, when there is no uh, acoustic uh, event. So to first to validate our uh, uh, image source modeling, we had uh, uh, set up the virtual room <laughs> So one of the imaginary room just uh, defined with a bunch of uh, coefficients. So we uh, put up uh, one uh, uh, source and uh, 3,020 sensors in the room, which is uh, not feasible at all, but in simulation we can do it so that we can have a nice uh, graph. And we are looking for the sound propagation or actually energy distribution through, through the room so that we can see whether the reverberation effect uh, is, is shown in, in our uh, simulation. Uh, important uh, parameter of this, uh, a part of the absorption coefficient, is this uh, decay time, which is basically uh, your reverberation time. Uh, T60 is, is a measurement when your signal is dropped by 60 decibels. It is possible also to use T20 or T30, depending on the, on the, on the uh, equipment that you have, so you can measure the uh, dynamic range of, of, the, of the sound. So uh, here are the results. When we uh, look at the non-echoic uh, room, so these absorption co coefficients are, are uh, non-existing or, or our reverberation time is zero, we see the, the sound propagation which is uh, kind of uh, the square of the distance and uh, we have no effect, so this is, this is just uh, if we are uh, uh, more uh, uh, if distance between the, the, the actual source and the si signal is uh, greater, the, the signal will just be at, uh, attenuated and not distorted. Uh, then we are actually doing the simulation of the ESM in these three cases using three different uh, uh, inputs uh, in, in on the sound source. So we use here white nose to um, make sure that we have a uh, all uh, uh, components in the spectrum and you can see the reverberation effects of the, the actual noise floor uh, in the room is 
much higher than, than uh, in the not echoic case. Then the interesting results are when we try to uh, apply this with a, a simple sine wave or a single sine wave, this is uh, 128 uh, hertz. You can see this harmonics and these are basically where uh, you have uh, your uh, stationary uh, waves uh, either summing up or, or, or dividing itself or, or cancelling it each other so that you have these curves and for the 1k uh, case with 1000 uh, hertz uh, you can see the, the really a, a, a mess here so that your uh, sensor uh, placement in, in the room is really important and especially when you look in the spectrum uh, where to put your sensor depending on the application what you want to to sense for and uh, actual monitoring of the of the room so and this is the the main idea uh, of the work to actually do a simulation before you actually place your sensors so that you can know where to uh, where to uh, put in what kind of a results you want, you want to expect. Then we are trying to do uh, more of the validation with trying to uh, uh, simulate uh, a real room. This is one of the room in the faculty uh, with uh, dimensions in, the, in, the, in one source and one sensor. And then we are trying to uh, to measure how much traffic we are generating with this sensor, uh, having these uh, parameters in in um, mind. So this calibration time is is 5,000, but it could be uh, uh, even longer if we just want to do that for the purposes of simulation. We're just limiting it like this. And uh, what we are actually doing in this experiment, we are making uh, variances of of the estimation block, which is the basically our uh, size of our packets that we are sending uh, in the RTP packet. RTP packet is uh, having the, the fixed uh, header size, which is just 40 octets, uh, like this. And the, for the all uh, sources that we use, or the signal that we use for the processing, we are uh, hand annotating what is the actual uh, sound uh, event and where, what is the silence. So this uh, lambda uh, coefficients is uh, signal uh, duration coefficient, uh, so basically uh, ratio between uh, uh, periods of sounds and periods of silence, so that we can uh, evaluate uh, the performance or, or, or from our noise gate comparing in, into this curve. So in a uh, theoretical sense, this is uh, going to be our uh, average data rate. So we set the maximum average data rate, which will be this naive case where we send the old data. So everything that is, uh, that is done here is just sensor constantly uh, sampling and sending data. You can see that for the smaller uh, packets, uh, there is this overhead uh, with with a header, of course, so you you uh, spend more bandwidth for that, and and uh, you get it even out when when the actual packets are uh, bigger. The when you multiply this with our lambda factor, you will get the the bottom line here, which is basically our uh, uh, ideal case where we have a noise gate on, on a sample level and we uh, put out only a significant data and not, uh, not a background noise. Uh, then we try to apply our uh, sensor algorithm without reverberation effect and we get these results. So uh, this is uh, due to uh, sampling over the blocks, so blocks are uh, just shifted in time and, and uh, misalignment between sound uh, or this acoustic event and our block will produce extra data so we are we are gathering the, the little bit of a noise uh, on, on the edges of the block so this is why this curve is a little bit uh, uh, 
different than the actual actual uh, theoretical minimum. And then we are trying to do uh, noise gate with uh, ESM and noise gate with uh, uh, real signal uh, captured in the room. And we can see that we are pretty much close. The differences are that, that we have not spent too much time on, on, on setting the proper absorption coefficients and, and, and uh, this decay time. So we want ju just roughly to see whether this could be used for calculating the average data rates and, and uh, the correlation between these uh, two curves is, is pretty much obvious. So uh, what is done with, with uh, related work in, in this area there are a lot of uh, acoustic sensing uh, um, using the wireless sensor network for environment, for tracking animals, for uh, doing a lot of different stuff. Uh, but a source traffic modeling of this kind, to the best of our knowledge, was non-existing. So uh, nobody uh, got uh, to this point to, to create a source traffic model having the sound propagation uh, in, in mind. So there is a, a, a medical sensor data like uh, uh, stuff that you have to wear to, to monitor a heart rate or something like that, so, or acoustic sensing for intrusion dete detection or a sensing actually for intrusion detection and target tracking, but nothing for, for actual acoustical sensing. Uh, we are relying, as I said, to, to Erwin Lehman's MATLAB code for, to some extent, but we actually improve it so that it could be applicable to really big data sets uh, uh, because uh, they're operating on, on the whole signal and when you try to run that code, you, you get out of memory pretty much easily. So we refactor all that to, to operate on, on the data chunks. There is this FP7 project called IRIT, which a lot of contribution in, uh, in acoustical sensing apply in the smart uh, city environment and, and this energy efficiency environment. And uh, a lot of uh, uh, sensor synergy with uh, trying to, to combine uh, acoustic sensing with the other sensing to actually make a, a sensor much richer and, and, and do a intelligence on, on top of that. There are new uh, platforms available. This Internet of Things uh, uh, arena is, is just piping and bringing the new... Uh, I'm running out of time, apparently. This, this new uh, platforms. And uh, we, we did a, a little bit of a voice interface based on a cloud base. So you can have your sensors and you can issue the, the voice commands and stuff like that. But just quickly to conclude, yes, quickly. We, de we developed a new uh, traffic model. Uh, it can have a, a lower the cost because you're doing a simulation prior to actually uh, uh, doing uh, uh, deployment. And a really interesting result is that significant uh, bandwidth saving is, uh, is possible with really uh, simple uh, energy-based algorithm like we propose here. So that will be all. Thank you for your attention. Of course, we start in coffee break. Yeah. <laughs> the session is completed. Uh, thank you for your contributions.
there are very, very few people, so the time is going very fast. Uh, my name is Kevin from Institute of Innovative Technology and also a professor from University in, in Wrocław. Uh, <coughs> And uh, so far, I have registered one, two, one, two, three, four, four, five papers. The first presenter will be <coughs> Dr. Ben Yusu, and the paper is on efficient fault feature extraction and fault isolation for high voltage DC transmissions. Please go ahead. <coughs> Okay, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Yusu from China University of Mining and Technology. Uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Efficient Photo Feature Extraction and Photo Isolation for High Voltage Disk Transmission. And the contents include um, five parts. The first is the introduction. The second is the problem to be solved. And the third is the proposed solution. And the fourth is the experiments and results. And the last one is the conclusions and the future work. Uh, first is the introduction. Uh, as you all know, high voltage direct current transmission has been widely accepted as a new generation technical for transmission of the electric power. Uh, this is because compared with the AC transmission, uh, the DC transmission has the following advantages. The first is distribution, because it is, can be long distance and also it is more economical. The second is quality in short distance because it can be a high quality <coughs> electrical power supply. And the third is technical. Uh, it can be operated at uh, different frequencies. Also, it has a better stability. However, also it has some disadvantages dis uh, dis uh, dis because the transmission line is very long and also fault mechanism is very complex. So it is very difficult to identify the key useful components for fault detection. Uh, at present, there exist uh, several solutions. Uh, the first one is the time frequency analysis on current voltage signals. The second is voltage transform. The third is independent component analysis. For the wavelet transformer, uh, it is powerful to nonlinear or no stationary signals. And uh, also, it is very efficient for high voltage uh, DC operation, but it only can deal with one sensor, one calculation. However, independent uh, component analysis has the ability to process the multi-channel sensor. So we have a idea we can combine the third <coughs> and the second together to process the data. So this is, this is our um, proposed <coughs> solutions. Uh, this is the workflow, and uh, this part. Sorry. The metal use. Okay. So this part, uh, the purpose of this part, uh, we try to get the model data, and after get the model data, we will input the network. Also, the new signals it means measure the data from the. Uh, transmission line, and uh, after processed of my master, also we input the network, and the network will compile two information, and then it will output the report. The report will tell us what fault it is. 
Uh, next is the experiments and the results. Uh, first is the numerical simulation. Uh, in this simulation, we choose the model of the first is a ground fault, the second is a land to land fault, uh, and the third is a curved fault of the land to ground and land to land. And, uh, and this is <coughs> the signal, uh, original signal, and this is the normal state, and this is the land to land fault. And this is the GJ fault, and this is the curve to line ground and line to line fault. For this original data, we processed using the ACA, and this is the result processed by the ACA method. And for this new data, we continue to process using the Wavelature transformer, and uh, after the processor, we will get the energy distribution. Uh, as shown in this table, uh, for different state, we will get the different uh, energy distribution. Based on based on those data, we will get the uh, detection rate. And this uh, data, this data. Uh, this rate is get from using different methods also, and this is my method or methods. So compared with other methods, uh, our method result uh, is better. It is better. And the next is experimental, uh, and this experimental is done in the quantum transmission line. And uh, this is one example, and this is the uh, original data, and this is the uh, original data is processor using ICA. Also, for this data, we will process the continue use the uh, wavelature transformer, and this is the uh, uh, process data. Also, this data is the uh, normal data. So, Next, uh, we will get uh, the detection rate. Also, this is uh, our method. Also, compared with other methods, uh, this uh, detection rate is better. So, next is our conclusion. In this research, we try to combine the HA and wavelength to process the data. Uh, also, uh, both numerical simulation and uh, experimental test shows uh, this method <coughs> is uh, reliable and feasible. Uh, next is our future work. Uh, in the future, we will continue to develop the room bond condition monitoring. Uh, also, we try to uh, put this measure, uh, use this method uh, in the practical application. Uh, okay, this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we'll take a little bit of discussion. Is there anybody who has some question? Ah, oh, please. No, no, it's you. Uh, may I have a question for you? Uh, of, thank you. That's very interesting. Interesting paper. You know, that's. Uh, but the, the most often we have in the power line we have uh, fall to the ground. Yeah. And the, the most dangerous. I know dangerous, but most most difficult to detect it. Yes. When yes. the ground resistance is very high. Yeah. If uh, if uh, its resistance is equal to zero, there's no problem with detecting this. But with increase of resistance, if, if for example you have a broken overhead mm. line mm. And, and touch to the ground yeah. and the touch on the on the stone or the sand, the resistance is very high. Are you able to detect such a system, such a, such a thing? Since in this way the current flowing is very little. Uh, because uh, this just the uh, uh, simulation and uh, this uh, technique have not been used for practical application. But uh, in the uh, simulation, it can be. But that, that's your work is only simulation, right? Yes. Okay, I understand. Okay. Any more question? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, gentlemen. According to schedule, the next should be the, the paper presented by Mr. Onku from Turkey. Is there, is there anybody no? Uh, this uh, the sibling, therefore, the, 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 the next, uh, let me have a presentation, my presentation.
too much. Okay, gentlemen, uh, uh, that's uh, the title is here. There was a bit of balancing the middle voltage network with the use of active power filter. Uh, that's a cooperative paper together with the uh, Russian University of Technology and the Institute of Innovative Technology. It's, uh, my name is Bogdan Mijinsky. Okay. First is the introduction, just a few words about the motivation was going on. Then the possibility of low balancing in the middle voltage with use active power filter. Then the theory of the uh, physical current components. It's, uh, there are many different theories. We use this, this, this theory to develop the algorithm for to control this, uh, this, uh, this system, and then application active power filter, and then the conclusions. Uh, for everybody, it's, uh, it's, it's common that in middle voltage distribution networks, uh, very often we have uh, unbalancing on asymmetry of that. This asymmetry uh, can be due to both uh, supply system and both to the load as well. And they, uh, particularly, that's, uh, that's visible in a long line supplying the, the huge distance when the, the load, uh, the one phase load, is, is it almost impossible to, to distribute uni uniformly. Therefore, that uh, uh, asymmetry, uh, unbalance, is unavoidable in the, in the system. However, however this, it, depends, it depends on the range. Uh, that's no that's no problem with voltage. Voltage it seems to be a little bit symmetric, but there's a big difference in the in the current loading the particular phases, and the current can generate the voltage drop, and the voltage drop in the common in the in the common system uh, can generate this this voltage <coughs> with quality of energy is very poor. As you very well know, that uh, in the case of asymmetry, immediately we have a symmetric components. It's, uh, we use the symmetric components to analyze just the system, you know, positive, negative, and zero sequence components. If it's asymmetry, immediately we have uh, two different components, zero sequence components and negative components. Zero sequence is not any problem, since in a zero sequence, even, even voltage exists for, for the current to flow, we have to have to the closed circuit. But for the, for the negative components, that's a, that's a problem, since if, if only we have a negative components, they produce rotating magnetic field, as you very well know, they're rotating in opposite to the positive component, and immediately is dangerous for the electrical motors, first of all. If about, uh, if about, uh, if about the problem of a load, you know, that's, uh, we have very asymmetric load also in industrial lines. For example, in the uh, welding machines, in the uh, high-speed uh, transportation, railway transportation, that's very, that's also, that's also created a lot of problems. And we were, uh, we were doing with, uh, uh, with the induction, induction furnace in, the, in a huge, uh, huge uh, uh, mine, a copper mine is in Poland, is a set, uh, set company in, in the world. And therefore, we, we did it for selected induction furnace for melting. Uh, that's, a, that's a selection of the this, of this system. We, we check, we make uh, measurements that, uh, you, as you see, that's, uh, that's a melting, that's a furnace, that's a furnace, that's simply inductor. That's simply inductor. And here, this inductor is supplied via transformers. This transformer is 1.6 megavolts amps. And here, as you see, that's uh, there's a one phase supply. And this, uh, the primary windings is due to the metal which be, will be melted. Uh, therefore, the, the work of is very unstable, and therefore, and also there's a high inductance here. And to reduce inductance in this circuit, which is composed of the of this inductor and the two branches, we have a capacity and in additional inductance. Uh, that's a compensation system. We use the capacity to compensate inductive current. Since in this system, the, the, the power factor, I mean, the cosine is very little, is point, point 0.3, point 0.4, something like this. Therefore, it draw tremendous, it, it would draw tremendous current through the transformer. To reduce it, it's, everything is done. That's asymmetrical, asymmetrical load. Therefore, to reduce it, usually we use symmetrization. We call this symmetrization. And symmetrization is made by Steinmetz. Steinmetz is uh, at, the, at the beginning of the 20th century. It was 19 something like this. And this, it, is, it is consists of a capacity and in additional inductance. However, it works good but for only for steady states. But in this case, we have, uh, we have very transient states. So it, everything depends on the, on the stuff on the stuff we have inside, on the metal which, is, which can be melted. And of course, this is being used for compensation for the for the electric for the power comp compensation. Uh, we checked we checked as you see that we we checked uh, we checked the uh, currents we checked the voltages at both sides uh, the middle volt side low volt sides best things and things, and we found out that if about the voltage uh, the pri the primary system at uh, the six kilovolts they're not asymmetric 
No, it's, it's very little. As you will see, there's a difference in, uh, between the IMS values very little. However, if about the current, we have, a, we, have a, we have a problem. We have a problem not only with asymmetry, is not balancing, but also that say, the wave are uh, distorted, tremendously distorted, therefore we have uh, high harmonics. That high harmonics is not also very good, since high harmonic flows through the transformers, and transformers wa work like a filter, and uh, in this filter we, we have to dissipate energy, and very often, it, in, therefore, this, this transform is damaged. The usually transformer, the power transformer, is, 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 is very expensive transformer, should work about the 20, 30 years, but very often after four years it's already, it's already over. That's, a, that's, a, that's a my, my main problem. If about the, the, the secondary side, as you see, as the voltage is also looks also symmetrical without any problems. However, the current is a, a, a tremendous difference, and tremendous difference is up to about 200% between particular phases, and even the, the, the difference, uh, the sh shift, angle shift is also very different. Therefore, in secondary, in secondary we, have, we, have, we have really problems. Uh, we compared IMS value measured of that, and you can see if about the primary voltage is a very little, therefore it is almost almost the same as level, uh, and the and the secondary also <coughs> the voltage it seems to be also okay. Therefore, with the voltage is not any problem. However, with the current, you see, and the secondary, you see, there's a big difference. There's a big asymmetry. Is about 800. Is about 550, and the big deformation. It's like this. This, this results from the fact that this, uh, this, uh, this heater is switched uh, periodically, or something like this. Therefore, as a matter of fact, we have in the primary current also we have asymmetry. You see asymmetry, as well the 50% uh, asymmetry with such things. And uh, what to do? You know, uh, how, to, how can we uh, over this problem? It's, um, since the, as, uh, it is obvious that this uh, static compensation system doesn't work. Uh, therefore, we decided to apply the um, uh, active power filter. The active power filter is a filter is a filter which is basically developed for the compensation of power compensation, reactive power compensation, in the case when the both current and voltage waveform are, are deformed. And we use it. And uh, we selected are many different theories. And we we are based on the theory of uh, CPC. Uh, current physical components, which is um, uh, uh, invited by, by invented by Professor Czarnecki. And however, there, there's not only one. There are many different theories. But this, it was found that this theory is very convenient for us. Basing on this theory, we developed the arg algorithm for control of the filter, and we got a very good result, as you will see. Uh, what is uh, the principle of this of this uh, theory of this uh, CSC component? We, we have, when you have, a, and, and the, this is the load, and this is the source. A uh, source can be nonlinear. There is a high harmonics in here. Load or can be also nonlinear, and uh, therefore we have uh, we divided the harmonics in two parts. One is the harmonics for, for which uh, the active power is positive. That means the energy is, is delivered from the source to the load, and another subset. This harmonics the load the load operates like a, uh, like a source and send the power back to the to the source. Therefore, as a matter of fact. We have uh, two two equivalent systems. You know, first for the when the energy is totally sent from the source uh, to the load, we have uh, such a components. You know, that's a, that's an active component, which is uh, the basic component which must be delivered to the load. And then we have uh, n balance. That's n balance. That's uh, which is uh, the, the the reactive power that results from this fact. And that's so-called scattering. A scattering results from the fact that uh, uh, the voltage is uh, this, this also this nonlinear uh, value, and also it depends on harmonics. That's in the case when the source uh, works like a source and deliver energy. And uh, the the this uh, this theory developed uh, the physical current components is very useful since physically we have a uh, different components, and if we wish, there are some equations. And basing on this equation, we can compensate particular components. Therefore, we are able to compensate it. And therefore, since it is imbalanced, which in this case is a key factor, we can compensate this value, and also we get balance of that. In another case, when the when the load is nonlinear load, and send energy back to the source. Therefore, in this case, the load became source, and source became became a load. And uh, as a matter of fact, as I already said, we distinguish here. Few harmonics, few few components. There's the active components. There's a, the, the is responsible for the active power from source to to, to the to the load. This is a scatter component. The scatter components is a is a occurring at the presence of harmonics in the supply voltage or in the impedance of load. It depends on frequency. 
And then there's the uh, ARC harmonics is a component, passive components, correlated with the occurrence of the receiver susceptance. Then is the end balance. End balance is components in the absence of balance of sources in those sites. And as a matter of fact, is IB components. IB components is include higher harmony generated to the network by nonlinear load. Therefore, the having this data, we can compensate each harmonics or particular harmonics up to us to obtain only the active harmonics, which is very useful in this case. When we compare IMS values, we obtain the, the polygon of the current components. As you see, the, the, this value is, perp is perpendicular to that, and that is perpendicular to the sum of that, something like this. That's a, this is equivalent. This all harmonics we can, we can compensate. And uh, we develop, basing on this theory, we, we, we develop algorithm for control the active power filter basing on the current physical components. You see that the analyze of harmonics, mm -hmm. analyze harmonics <coughs> and currents, the calculation of the apparent power and the uh, real power and reactive power, then separation harmonics in two sets. In two sets. One is a, a subset NA and another to subset NB. That's all well depending on the, on the sign of that. Then the calculation of this, then the calculation, and as a matter of fact, we can calculate this, mm -hmm. va this value and we can compensate, we can generate, we can generate there's a, a, and inject such a value to the system to compensate this, this components. Uh, to prove it, we, we perform the uh, simulation. But simulation is a simulation. And everybody can do a simulation, but you have to, to check it experimentally, what's going on. And we did an experiment. That's an experiment, experimental set. And experimental was done for uh, uh, N-balance, both linear. Linear is not, rec not supplied by rectified, but the unload load. And non-linear load, non-linear load is, is, is a load supplied by rectifier. That's a non-linear load. And also this asymmetry, asymmetry was made <coughs> by, by performing by resistance between two phases. And here in this case, we have an active power filter which is based on these things. That's a transformer about 10 megavolts amps. And as a matter of fact, <coughs> you see that's, a, that's, a, that's effect of APF application, that before application, after application, you see that's, a, that's for, for uh, asymmetry. However, with, with linear load, with linear load, you said the load is linear, there is no deformation. However, there's only difference in the value. This value is also smaller. When we use these things, it already is already symmetrical. And uh, however, the worst situation is when, the, when we have uh, asymmetry, I mean, end balancing, and also deformation of the current and, and the voltage waveforms, like here, the deformation of current waveforms that before application and that's after application. That's the currents. Of course, they not look like ideal, but it's similar than you just some little like flickers, something like this, but this results from the bad filtration of that. Therefore, these results are very optimistic. And uh, what we do just now, we concluded that uh, this end balance load for particular things can be overcome here, but using this, our system. And we plan to do that to develop the structure of this type of balancing system for, you, for metal foundries. That's metal foundries. The worst situation is when we have uh, only one inductor. Therefore, the, the stability is very bad. And for these things, we, we, are, we are trying just now to, to develop such a system and to involve some system in practice. Perhaps in the close future, I would be able to send you more details if, if I am able to do that. OK, thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> I would be pleased to have a question from you to have a chance to answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm confused. Uh, the load is quite high, and you are using just one phase. Uh, what do I face? Was a three phase? Mm. I think it was like number four something. I see. Yeah, this, this is. What do you mean? The one, one at the bottom left. Here? Yeah. Yeah, that's one phase. Uh, that's the worst situation. It, it depends on the power of the furnace. There's only one, one inductor. In yeah, the, in I, I, in I know, but is it necessary? Is it necessary to use just one phase? Not necessary. In another, in another company, they use another heater, and this another heater to, to make a, the balance is composed of the six such things. And they are supplied by different line, line them. and this way we get better result. However, still is it is a problem. We already tested other things. And my next question is: mm -hmm. uh, for motors, we have uh, frequency converter. Mm -hmm. 
isn't it possible to arrange similar same thing uh, for the heater? Uh, then uh, the control would have been smoother. You don't have to switch on and off uh, rapidly. You can do it smoothly. Absolutely, absolutely, you are right. But you know that's that. But doesn't depend on us. You know, it depends on the company. We first we have to. Uh, to find out some people who will support us and allow us to do that mm -hmm. and give us money for doing that. But once you do the correction, uh, actually for them it's no longer important what you do. Oh yeah, that you, you do. Oh, you okay. Just supply the power and this is it. That's right, you're absolutely right. Right. Okay. Uh, as a non-expert in this field, I was only curious when you connect various active power filters to the network does it somehow affect uh, power consumption instruments? That's very little. Really? It's about less than 5%. Well, you, you don't distort, uh, because there are instruments on the, on the internet, they say, just by connecting, you will not pay for uh, power consumption. No, 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 no. It's a power consumption which checks about less than 5%. I mean, I'm talking <coughs> about the active power consumption. It's about 5%. Okay, more question? Thank you very much for your attention. <coughs> okay, uh, the next speaker. Uh, okay, please. Wait a moment, therefore, it will be next, okay? Sorry. It uh, will be Dr. Uh, pardon, Dr. Oze? Yes, right? Oze. Okay, please go ahead. You have reduction of AMIE with caustic space vector modulation and direct torque control. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, that's it. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Bedri Özer. I am from Turkey, Fırat University. Uh, these photos are uh, my historical cities photos. My presentation title is Reduction of Electromagnetic Interference with Chaotic Space Vector Modulation in Direct Torque Control. Direct Torque Control is uh, a useful control method for AC drives and uh, space vector modulation is a modulation technique. Uh, our aim is uh, to reduce the electromagnetic interference in AC drives. As you know, all uh, electrical systems have specific electromagnetic interference limit. In AC drives, inverters are one of the main sources of electromagnetic interfaces. Filters and other classical uh, electromagnetic interface reduction methods bring extra cost and weights. So, uh, aim of this paper is that uh, the resolution of electromagnetic interference uh, is to prevent it from its source. Uh, sorry. We choose permanent magnet, uh, permanent magnet sen uh, synchro motor for this aim. Why we choose this motor? Because it is uh, uh, it has become really competitive to an asynchro motor uh, in terms of lifetime cost. This motor has recently become quite attractive due to its many advantages. In induction motor, uh, the rotors have windings, but in this uh, motor type, rotor has only magnets, so it's the advantage of this kind of motors. But uh, there is an disadvantage. There is a disadvantage of these motors: fuzz inductance of surface surf surface mounted permanent magnet signal motor is less than induction motor. So the effect of electromagnetic noise is greater when compared to induction matter. Uh, why we choose direct torque control method? Direct torque control method is a high performance control method. was originally developed for asynchronous motors and then it was applied to permanent magnet synchron motors. But uh, there is a des disadvantages of uh, director control methods. What is that? Uh, variable and low switching frequency, acoustic noise, high torque, and high flux ripples, sensitivity uh, stutter resistance to 
temperature at low frequencies and integrator deviations can be considered as the disadvantages of conventional direct torque control methods. Uh, many methods were used to improve the weakness of uh, the conventional direct torque control methods. Many studies have been conducted on space vector direct torque control methods. Uh, but uh, some other features are available, such as excessive knowledge of parameters, rotary coordinate transformation, and high competitions are the disadvantages of uh, space vector modulation. In literature, there are many uh, studies uh, for, redu uh, for reduction of electromagnetic interference. Uh, random PVM techniques has been developed for this aim. Random PVM are carried out in various ways, such as random switching frequency, random pulse position technique, random switching techniques, and etc. It was displayed that acoustic noise and electromagnetic interference were suppressed by using, ran by using random PVM techniques in space vector modulation algorithms. And uh, literature go on. Methods having various switching frequencies, like random or chaotic PVM, are generally applied to induction motor. However, in this context, there are a limited there are a limited number of research about random PVM on a permanent magnet synchrome motors. Chaotic PVM techniques are the ones developed as an alternative to random PVM techniques. A chaotic signal is obtained more easily than the random signal, and it's also simpler to apply. Uh, Zeng and all in their research said that applied chaotic PVM methods to the induction motor drive and indicated that electromagnetic interface, acoustic noise, and mechanical vibrations are reduced. Our aim is this red one, studies, studies using chaotic PVM in permanent magnet synchro motor drives could not be found in the literature. Uh, what is electromagnetic interference? As all know, current and voltage wave forms include harmonics at higher levels of energy above the main frequency. Uh, however, uh, I can pass this to say. However, it would be more beneficial and more eff effective to find solutions to problem at its source. Formula, uh, evet, yes, it's important. Electromagnetic <coughs> interface spreading via transmission path is comprised of two categories. One is common mode CM and other is differential mode. Common mode, uh, uh, mode is that uh, com in common mode currents are measured between fuzz and ground. But in differential mode, currents are measured between the different phases of the inverter. This one, uh, ground and one phase. This one, different, two phase. And this is the formulas of VCM and VDM. This is the classical conventional uh, space vector modulations uh, formulas space vector formulas uh, and the other formulas. Uh, in our proposed method, we focus angular velocity. In this uh, conventional method, here is fixed. But in our <coughs> proposed method, we change it by chaotically. You will show. Uh, we use logistic map, which is the well-known chaotic map. Uh, its formula is in the equation 8. This is a chaotic map. Uh, his, uh, its name is logistic map. A is the parameter. And this is a graphic of logistic map bifurcation diagram. This axis is Xn. And this axis is parameter, A parameter. As you shown in the figure, after 3.6, this map behave chaotic. Uh, this map, uh, this map is a. This map seems chaotic behavior. After three point 
seven, six here. We use chaotic map in this range. We use chaotic map in this range. How we can use it? The proposed chaotic space vector modulation frequency formula is that uh, F is real switching frequency, FCV for fixed switching frequency, delta F for amount of frequency change, FM for modulation frequency, <coughs> and this XN is a parameter coming from our chaotic map, logistic map here. He changed the frequency. He changed the frequency of inverter. This is the uh, examples of switching frequencies. TA, TB, TC formulas are given here. And the results of PVM output is like that. This is the all model, proposed all model. Space vector modulation uh, inverter. Uh, direct torque control, so uh, torque reference, PI controller, equation 19, uh, equation 19 is here. This is the, our proposed method, chaotic space vector direct torque control method, inverters output. Uh, here, 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 uh, this is come from <coughs> permanent magnet synchron motors. UDC and voltage and um, uh, currents. I want to give some resolution, some uh, uh, results. We mentioned uh, VCM and VDM. This is classical conventional direct torque control, power spectral density. This is our proposed method. And this is another method in literature, random space vector modulation. Random space vector modulation. It's new in literature. It's our proposed method. And it is conventional space vector modulation. As you seen, harmonics are bigger in this situation. Uh, figure B and figure C are good, better than this. Uh, the same is for VDM, uh, conventional space vector modulation, our proposed method and uh, another literature, another new method, random space vector modulation. Uh, another result for stutter currents, uh, power spectrum of stutter currents, uh, conventional director control, <coughs> our proposed methods, and another methods. The last result is harmonic analysis for stutter current. As you see, near switching frequency, there is a big harmonic in classical conventional, uh, sorry, conventional director control. But our proposed method, it is not seen like this. Conclusion, in the simulations, uh, conventional space vector director control methods, chaotic uh, space vector director control, and random space vector director control are compared. In comparisons, electromagnetic inference and acoustic noise, noise levels in chaotic space vector director control and random space vector direct con director control are lower when compared to those of conventional space vector director control method. In addition, it is observed that the current harmonics around the switching frequency are also decreased. The results are closed in chaotic modulation method and random mod modulation method. However, when compared to the chaotic signal, it is more difficult to obtain and apply random signal but chaotic signal can be readily obtained from an chaotic oscillator or a chaotic map, map like a logistic map. Therefore, it can be said that chaotic methods would be more efficient and applicable 
Then uh, random space vector director control methods. Thank you for attention. on the shaft of the electrical motor, right? Yes. Okay, in which way you ma measure it? Use a sensor on this? Uh, sensors and estimating part, right. Okay, but estimating is a, okay, but the first you have some signal on the sensor. You, you yes. Put, you put the sensor, tensometer, yes. tensometer, something like yes, that. Yes, yes, sensor. Oh, tensometer. And in which way is it you send the signal? Since uh, that's, uh, that's a serious problem, you know. Which way you send it? Wire, wireless? The wire. Wire. Wire at its simulation study, not a uh, practical uh, okay. study. Okay, but uh, even that is very interesting. And we also we also we, we face this problem, and uh, we didn't want how to how to overcome it. But it's your it's your inter very interesting way. But we plan to do it is uh, in the wireless way. Is it wireless. worse worse situation? It's okay. a worse situation than that is. But th that's very useful in future works. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, please go ahead. I have, I have one question. Actually, we are talking about the EMI, correct? Electromagnet interference. Mm -hmm. So I think that when we look at the frequency, so I see that on the X scale, the, you go to kilohertz, you know, 25 kilohertz. Uh, Just a minute. There are uh, standards for the uh, AC drivers or any uh, electronic equipment. I think it is good to look at the megahertz to see the electromagnetic interference to meet the standards. But as much as I can see here, uh, we look at only the harmonics, you know. I was expecting, you know, I was trying to, I, I, I'm, I'm, I was planning to see that, you know, the, the, the megahertz level frequency is supposed to be higher here, maybe 400 kilohertz, uh, uh, megahertz to see the interference uh, with the uh, grip. And then after that, we can say that this device, this driver, require a EMI filter or not. Now, up to here, only I can say that the, in terms of the harmonics, there are more or less. And uh, as a number, if I see the THD, like I will uh, mm -hmm. 519, the standards, if you go put it there, you know, this is the uh, THG of the, our design is, for example, 15%, the other was 10%, uh, whatever. Okay. And uh, this is, this, did you look at the, the higher frequencies, like a megahertz? No, I didn't look. Okay. But in similar uh, studies, I see that uh, 9 to 150 kilohertz are used. So uh, I used this range. Okay, mm -hmm. but the but the industry to be accepted this driver, uh -huh. so it is good to look at the class A, class B. It is going up yes. to megahertz. That's right. And the other thing is switching is uh, the space vector uh, modulation you are doing. And uh, what was the uh, procedure or algorithm to uh, choose the zero vector? Is do you have any? Uh, no standard zero vector. Uh, because you can have uh, different zero vectors, zero, 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 or one, uh, one, one. As you know, uh, eight vectors are yes. what, 12. Do, do, you have, do you have any preference to choose? Because it may affect the EMI. So because the EMI is, you know, the case of the, actually this is a, this is simulation, but still I think it may affect the EMI, you know, the choosing the zero vector. Because it is, Telling you that transition between the states, you know, you you choose the wrong zero states, so it make uh, more switchings. So it, it will affect definitely the uh, yeah. Yeah. more switching, more vibrations. Yeah. We use this equation to select the vectors. Six of them are active, two of them are zero. Mm -hmm. yes. uh -huh. We use this formula. Yes. Stand, uh, classic. One, yeah, but which one do you pick? Sorry? There are two choices, am I right, for the zero? Yes. Which one do you pick, you know? Because two, one? Yes. Do you, do you have any preference for that? No, no. no. Thank, Thank you very much. One oh, no question? If not, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs> Thank you, my pleasure.
Okay, uh, the okay. next is the guy who is the late. It's, uh, please, I'm so sorry. That's uh, this. You came from Turkey or just you drank a lot yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, that's. Uh, uh, you have you as a second author, yeah? And you are talking about the simulant model of parallel resonance or something like that? Yes, the okay. uh, simulant model of parallel resonance. Yeah, okay. And your name is uh, Selim Monkou, your doctor? Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Selim Öncü. Uh, I work in Karabük University Department of Electrical Engineering and uh, I am from Turkey. Our study is about simulink model of parallel resonant inverter with DSP based PLL controller. Uh, power density of uh, converters can be increased by increasing the switching frequency. However, there are some problems when we increase the switching frequency. Uh, switching losses are increases when we choose higher switching frequencies. Uh, but by using resonant converters, switching frequencies can be decreased by soft switching techniques. So we studied about a uh, soft switching technique in uh, parallel resonant inverter and we controlled the co uh, this inverter by using DSP control module. Switching losses, uh, in order to reduce switching losses, resonance frequency has an important role in this kind of converters or inverters. So, uh, first of all, we choose the resonance frequency and uh, we try to cache this resonance frequency. In this study, in our study, uh, we used closed loop phase lock loop uh, control techni technique for parallel resonant inverter and we designed to uh, track the resonant frequency uh, in this inverter. In the literature we found that some uh, PLL control techniques by using DSPs were studied. Uh, these are generally about series resonance converters or series resonance inverters. Uh, we applied this technique to parallel resonant inverter. And design inverter is simulated with <coughs> MATLAB Simulink uh, module. The validity of the Simulink model of current source inverter, it is another name of parallel resonant inverter, is tested for different load and gain uh, levels and simulated uh, DSP control unit can be implemented by uh, TMS 28F uh, 335 model. After this study, we, we applied uh, and we set the experimental study uh, and we test it by experimentally. What is current source inverter? You see from the figure that uh, current source inverter has two uh, unidirectional switch and a resonant bridge like this RLC parallel resonant bridge and uh, filter coil uh, DC voltage source and unidirectional switch like this these switches can be IGBT MOSFET or BGT and these diodes blocks the uh, anti-parallel currents uh, one of the main advantage of current source inverter has the short circuit, short circuit protection capability and power switch can be driven with similar simple gate drive circuits because all the switches are uh, common mode they have ground connection and equivalent circuit of parallel resonant inverter can be driven like this the Voltage source and <coughs> filter coil can be modeled as a square wave current source and parallel resonance circuit is the same. Uh, according to switching of power switches, MOSFETs or IGBTs, we can create a square wave uh, input current to resonance circuit according to resonance circuit and 
changing the frequency, output power of the circuit can be uh, changed. In the inverter, the fundamental component of the generated square wave current sin sinusoidal at resonant frequency. <coughs> it means that when we choose switching frequency at resonance frequency, uh, uh, fundamental component of the square wave current will be purely sinusoidal. The resonance circuit behaves, behaves like a purely resistive load when we choose resonance frequency uh, as a switching frequency. Therefore, Therefore, soft switching, it means in this circuit, zero voltage switching can be accomplished. And these are theoretical waveforms of uh, parallel resonance conver inverter. Uh, this is uh, control signal of power switch, and square wave current is driven by this current, uh, by this switch, power switch. Uh, according to uh, switching frequency, when you choose, when we choose this converter's frequency to the resonance frequency, uh, output voltage of the circuit, output voltage of the circuit will be in phase with uh, input current of the inverter branch. So, uh, switch current and switch voltage will be in this <coughs> chain. It means that zero voltage turn on and zero voltage turn off as a result zero voltage switching can be achieved according to this we, uh, we need to track the resonant frequency to have soft switching conditions now uh, i will explain the dsp control unit to accomplish the track the resonant frequency the output voltage of the inverter is detected and discretized by the dsp uh, the MOSFET gate signals is compared with output voltage and phase difference between output voltage and switching uh, signal is detected with X or gate, logical gate, but in the DSP model. The logical output is filtered to the DC volume, volume by the low pass filter. It has a DC component and the difference between these two signals according to uh, DC value is discretized and new periodic period is calculated. Uh, this period is a result of error between uh, phase difference between uh, MOSFET gain signal and output voltage. The new MOSFET drive signal is generated with voltage controlled oscillator. As a result, the inverter tracks the resonant frequency by minimizing the error between uh, these two different signals. And the block diagram of this explanation is seen in this figure. According to this, here is our parallel resonant inverter. And we control the switch by the SP control unit. It uh, detects the output voltage and discretizes it. Voltage control oscillator and uh, gate signal is compared with XOR gate block. And low pass filter, we have DC component and according to this DC component, we create a new uh, frequency by using voltage control oscillator. And error is uh, minimized by using two different signals uh, according to new voltage of low pass filter new frequency is near the resonant frequency or adjust the uh, accurate resonant frequency <coughs> and our simulink model is seen now uh, in this figure here is our uh, RLC uh, parallel network this is low pass uh, sorry, uh, filter coil, choke coil, and DC voltage source are uh, blocking diodes, power MOSFETs, and PLL system block, and voltage sensor. In PLL system block, there are uh, voltage uh, sensing part and the screen time integrator XOR gate, as seen before the block diagram and we uh, create a new voltage according to this error signal. Here is 
uh, uh, low pass filter and DC uh, voltage is uh, input as discrete time integrity voltage control oscillator. <coughs> as a result, new uh, switching frequency is calculated in this point. And some uh, simulation results uh, are taken by Simulink mode. Our uh, test conditions for two different loads, one of them is 150 and the other one is uh, 300 ohm uh, loads. And uh, we use same uh, inductors for choc coil and for different resonant conditions we ch change the resonant condens condens uh, con uh, capacitor. Uh, according to this, we start uh, from 33 kilohertz initial frequency, and according to this uh, frequency, we uh, try to catch the resonant frequency. Here, this is the startup condition of uh, our proposed uh, study, and it starts with same, but after that, load uh, current and voltage is uh, phase difference is 90 degree uh, it is catched it is seen after time uh, a, a bit time later <coughs> this is discrete time integrator output uh, signal and uh, load voltage uh, starts the uh, conditions uh, in this point one millisecond. I, another uh, simulation results for different load values and this is this is uh, switch current and this one is switch voltage according to these simulation results we can see that it is in same phase uh, and zero voltage switching in these points can be accomplished by uh, using our the DSP control unit in, and it means that PLL is achieved by using DSP controlled model. It is very important to achieve zero voltage switching for high frequency and high power converters. Another uh, test results for load B, as seen from the figure, it is also uh, achieved zero voltage switching for different loads. Some uh, calculated and simulated results is shown in this page. Uh, according to simulated and calculated results, it is very nearly the same. We have good uh, results from calculated and simulated points. As a result, in this paper, we used a DSP controlled PLL algorithm while using MATLAB Simulink module. Uh, according to simulation and calculation results, a uh, designed PLL algorithm for the parallel resonant inverter tracks the resonant frequency perfectly for different quality factors and resonant parameters. This, the system performance is tested for different uh, discretized integrated module and we sh uh, show that uh, it can be accomplished for different load conditions. Thank you very much uh, for your attendance. Thank you. Any, any questions? Your presentation question. Please. Uh, I wanted to ask what was the frequency of your PWM signals? We start with initial frequency and we can choose it. Uh, uh, it is not a problem for us. After that, uh, the initial frequency is start to uh, <coughs> starts to uh, <coughs> drive the MOSFETs. According to uh, output voltage uh, sensor, we compare MOSFET signal and output voltage, and it increases or decreases according to resonant parameters. And it, it is about 60 kilohertz. 60 kilohertz. Mm -hmm. Because I guess it somehow relates to the performance of processor you are using. And if you think in the future about this new uh, one megahertz frequencies. It may be. Then maybe this DSP performance is not enough. Uh, one megahertz may be very high frequency for uh, this kind of uh, study, 
but uh, more than a hundred killers. We test it in simulation results, and we had we had good uh, results for catching resonant frequency, but we didn't test it uh, for one megahertz. Mm -hmm. okay. It may be, but I don't know uh, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? If you don't see, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Professor Shinkevichus, uh, and uh, he will have a presentation on research of condenser resistance measurement using single contact substrate. Please, Professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. from uh, Kaunas University of Technology and I present a very interesting method for surface resistance measurement. Uh, this method is used for uh, thin film technology and uh, <coughs> we cannot in the technology uh, used additional uh, source of voltage or current. And so, uh, at this moment, are known traditional uh, some methods for uh, measurements of surface resistance. For example, four points, two points. And uh, we try to present method with one contact. How with one contact measure surface uh, resistance. Also, uh, known methods uh, used additional, uh, additional current or voltage sources. We create method, mathematical model of this method, and uh, experimentally tested this uh, uh, mathematical method. Our uh, equipment experimental uh, consists from a, a vacuum chamber. We have evaporator with uh, heated with uh, high uh, current and metal uh, vapor uh, fall up <laughs> to our props and here we do our measurements. We have also shooter with uh, when shooter is off uh, space chart is here disappear and we have uh, possibility measure resistance without space charge because very high density of electrons. Uh, our props which we used, it is then a ribbon with two contacts area or one contact area without this. And one probe, uh, same size is from metal to measure uh, electromotive force of evaporator, of electron emissions. Uh, electrical circuits of our experiments consist of four probes. First probe here is full metal sheets. Uh, with this probe we measure electromotive force of electro emissions. Uh, two two area, two contacts probe. <coughs> With this, this uh, probe we used some, year, some years. It is uh, a very good uh, method because produced bell-shaped signal and uh, extrema, uh, time of extrema can be used for control of process. And one contact probe, one contact probe, <coughs> This contact is grounded through this resistance. And for control, we used a traditional uh, method of uh, resistant measure, measurement with two contact and stabiliz stabilized current. With low, I uh, remember, 7 volts uh, voltage current, but uh, current is very small and optical uh, isolated amplifier um, uh, amplifier <coughs> and this probe uh, have no uh, 
electrical uh, circuit with uh, other electrical circuits. Our experiments, uh, two contact probe, as uh, I say, with uh, extrema, bell form, bell shape form. Uh, one contact probe, uh, signal grow uh, monotonically to saturation state. Uh, tradi uh, traditional method uh, measurement of resistance. But uh, as you see, uh, we can uh, see true resistance from this point only, because here is saturation zone. We cannot, uh, with this method, uh, measure in this, in this time. And electromotive force. Uh, electromotive force changes because uh, wire, uh, wire back with metal uh, is <coughs> Uh, melting, uh, melted with uh, metal and surface uh, changes surface and also changes uh, electromotive force. Uh, we created model of this method of measurements and here we see surface resistance is divided to small shapes of resistance here is equivalent uh, resistance of inner, uh, inner uh, resistance of electromotive force and here is electromotive force equivalent electromotive force because we use additional uh, tungsten uh, heater uh, for, uh, uh, more, for more electrons. And uh, our probe has only one area, contact area, uh, which is grounded uh, through resistor, uh, this resistor. And created mathematical model, very simple mathematical model, uh, differential equation. Uh, here is a picture uh, uh, with one probe, uh, one contact area probe, more simplified. And we uh, uh, have a solution of our differential equation for, uh, for each point uh, along uh, along probe. And here is uh, solution of this differential equation for this contact area. It is very difficult uh, uh, equation because we have no um, how calculated uh, resistance uh, in simple method. And <coughs> some explain about uh, direct measurements. Uh, our system can direct measure about 19 mega ohms uh, surface uh, resistance. If resistance is higher, we cannot measure because we are in saturation uh, zone. But we can uh, ex extrapolate uh, this uh, curve and uh, calculate uh, to left <laughs> side some uh, resistance uh, with some errors. And <coughs> how we tested, uh, how we tested uh, mathematical model of this uh, method of measurements. Uh, this is equation of uh, potential on uh, one area of probe. Uh, this dashed line is measured signal and this uh, solid line is calculated from model. But we have some differences uh, in each point. Uh, it is effect of uh, contact area of contact area uh, size. Uh, if contact area smaller, this voltage will be smaller. We later created a mathematical model that include this area and uh, <coughs> this uh, difference is, is smaller. And conclusions. Uh, we have method 
uh, for surface uh, resistance uh, measure with one contact. Also, we can use two contact, but signal twice, uh, <laughs> twice <coughs> better, and <coughs> we have maximum. Uh, we have no used uh, uh, additional uh, additional uh, sources of current or voltage. Uh, signal monotonically increases, and uh, we can uh, calculate resistance at each in each uh, moment. Mathematical model uh, very good describe this process and uh, last conclusion mathematical model uh, will be necessary uh, <laughs> evaluate area of, of contact plates of probes uh, this area <coughs> this this uh, area is very small but uh, enough to affect uh, for signals and thanks for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Any questions? May I have a question, please? Uh, it's a very interesting method. Uh, since uh, nowadays we use uh, widely the printing boards for, for, for different coils, different for measurements uh, with Rogowski coils are very popular nowadays. Mm -hmm. Could we use your method to measure this, uh, this resistance? Of this coil, the printing printing boards. Uh, like the this coil. There's a coil. There's a coil. Can we uh, use this Magnetic field affect condensation process, and we cannot use. Uh, cannot. Cannot use the magnetic field. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. More question? Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Is the next uh, paper, uh, the next presentation will be given by Dr. Ocon. Please go ahead from Wrocław University of Technology, Poland, and uh, the title is Load Flow Computations in Different Coordinate System for Power System with UPFS. Please go ahead. Lepiej tam, lepiej tam użyć tej, tego stacji, stacji. Ok, ok. Ok. I have a pleasure to present you uh, our results of our investigation uh, on uh, power flow uh, computation in power system with uh, UPFC uh, device. Uh, in power flow computation, uh, we we uh, we try to find. Uh, we, we calculate a uh, nodal uh, phasor, voltage phasor, and uh, voltage phasor uh, can be presented in polar coordinate system uh, when we have voltage magnitude and uh, 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 phase voltage, or in rectangu rectangular coordinate system then we have real and imaginary part of this uh, uh, voltage phasor. Uh, yes. uh, I have to add that uh, in the literature, the most popular uh, what I found is uh, the most popular is uh, powerful computation in a, a polar coordinate system. So. Uh, in power flow computation, we need to uh, solve uh, uh, non-linear equations. Uh, so the most, I think, uh, the most effective method is a uh, Newton-Raphson. Uh, in Newton-Raphson, uh, we, we find a, uh, in each iteration we we find a, a approximation of state vector. Uh, if we if we consider power flow uh, power flow computation in power coordinate, uh, coordinate system, uh, we can uh, we can consider problem as uh, follow here, or uh, this approach is also possible. 
uh, when we use a, a rectangle, uh, rectangular coordinate system, we have problem <coughs> uh, like here. So, uh, a unified power flow controller is composed from uh, two AC-DC inverters, uh, which can which can be uh, modeled as a uh, two voltages, uh, two uh, controllable voltages uh, sources, and uh, shunt voltage, uh, uh, magnitude of shunt voltage, usually uh, in literature, I, what I found is uh, minimum value is uh, 0 0.9 and maximum uh, 1.1. Series voltage can uh, change from zero to uh, zero point two. Uh, when we uh, uh, for for uh, controlling uh, this uh, by controlling this voltage, we can determine uh, uh, determine uh, power fl uh, power flow through the line. Uh, in uh, in our program, I can uh, set uh, this voltage, the uh, uh, phase of this voltage, and determine uh, power flow, or I can uh, uh, set uh, some power flow active and reactive, and calculate uh, uh, values of uh, this phase. Uh, when we uh, have a UPFC, uh, we need to, to, to uh, consider this UPFC in power flow com uh, computation. We need to uh, add uh, this, uh, uh, add, uh, this uh, equation to, uh, to set of equation uh, in power flow uh, program. Uh, when we consider a uh, power flow in polar coordinate system, uh, the with UPFC, the Jacobian uh, may look like here. Uh, this Jacobian is for situation when we uh, set a power flow through the line with a UPFC device, and we calculate uh, s uh, s series voltages uh, in UPFC. Here I have a second approach. So uh, now we need to look at uh, this, uh, this uh, element of Jacobian. Uh, if we uh, take a look uh, closer at this equation, we see that when uh, this uh, voltage is close to zero, uh, the whole column uh, may be close to zero, uh, so it leads to uh, ill conditions uh, of uh, Jacobian. Or if uh, this voltage is zero, we have all column uh, equal zero, so we have uh, 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 we have uh, Jacobian singular. So in this situation, we cannot uh, solve a problem. When we consider power flow computation in a rectangular coordinate system, uh, we don't have uh, such a problem. Uh, in some papers, uh, we can find uh, uh, this equation uh, uh, to to uh, determine a uh, starting point for a uh, UPFC device. Uh, however, in, in my opinion, it sometimes it doesn't work uh, very well. So, uh, our investigation I, I, uh, we did on uh, 14 bus 
IT, IT, IEEE 14 bus test system. Uh, UPFC uh, was installed uh, between buses 4 and 5. Uh, mm, shunt inverter of UPFC operated as a voltage regulator, so uh, it, uh, it kept uh, a voltage at the node 5 on constant value. Uh, first, I uh, set uh, uh, the following uh, series voltages uh, with, uh, uh, and I change the uh, uh, phase of uh, this voltage uh, and phase angle of this voltage, and, and I determine uh, 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 power flow uh, uh, through the line. In the uh, with the uh, UPFC device, then next I use this power flow, which I uh, calculated uh, in the beginning, and I try to calculate uh, this voltage. So uh, uh, when we um, investigate a condition number. Uh, in my calculation, uh, condition number uh, say us how uh, how conditioned uh, problem is. When condition number is very high, we have very uh, ill-conditioned uh, formulation of the problem, and we can have a problem with uh, the with uh, calculation uh, of power flow. So when we have a polar coordinate system. We can see that when the uh, VCR R is, is very small, the problem is very uh, badly conditioned. Uh, this problem we don't have for rectangular coordinate system. Uh, this uh, for rectangular coordinate polar, uh, co uh, recta rectangular coordinate system. Uh, practically, uh, uh, VC VCR uh, doesn't inf influence on condition on conditioning. So here we have a result of investigation uh, when we uh, set uh, different starting point. Here, solution was when VCR was uh, zero, and it's depending uh, which, depending on starting point, we obtained uh, this uh, the following condition number in successive iteration. So when we started from a small value, we couldn't start from from zero. Uh, I started. Uh, from uh, 0 0.001 uh, at the beginning condition number was uh, very high but we receive uh, uh, receive uh, results after 10 iteration here I started from the 0 0.2 and I receive a solution after 12 or 13 iteration. When the solution was, when VCR was 0 0.2, uh, we needed a smaller number of uh, iteration. When we consider a power flow in rectangular coordinate system, we can see that uh, in in any case, case when a VCR was z zero or VCR uh, was zero point two, we have results after six iteration. So here I have uh, results, <coughs> and we can see that the polar coordinates when we have a polar coordinate system, usually we need around, I mean, uh, fifteen. Or 20 iteration, and 
it doesn't matter uh, from starting point. Uh, uh, we can see that when we uh, VCR is calculated, the situation sometimes is, is worse uh, than we have VCR uh, set as a, a 0 0.2. When we use a rectangular coordinate system, every time we have practically uh, six iterations. So, uh, presence of UPFC in power system uh, force us to increase increasing a set of values in power system uh, model. Uh, we found that a series voltage uh, can uh, can cause uh, some uh, problems, especially when we use a polar coordinate system. Uh, when we use a rectangular coordinate system, we don't have uh, such a problems, and power flow computation in uh, recta rectangular coordinate system uh, is faster. We need less iteration, but I don't know why this, uh, this formulation is less popular in literature. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? I mean that you proved that uh, the calculation coordinate system gave the best results, and but it has to be some reason that it, in the past it was involved to calculation. You don't you don't think, but what, what could be a reason? Maybe, no, no. maybe it looks uh, simpler. I uh -huh. don't know because you know when you have a polar coordinate system, uh -huh. you have a voltage, you have a phase angle. Uh -huh. It looks like uh, more familiar than than, uh, okay. than uh, imaginary or you know, part of phase. Uh -huh. Usually, it is, it is, it is science is that somebody publish something and everybody just try to follow him. But uh, just uh, okay, please go ahead. In addition to that, David, the, the companies who distributed uh, the power, mm -hmm. they have already program. Ah, by the, this system. So you know, mainly what uh, still they are using, for example, for France seven seven. Uh -huh. So still, because uh -huh. in their database is okay. running that program, so okay. maybe, maybe this is the. Case that people are working on. Thank you very much for the uh, explanation. Thank you, thank you very much. One day I talked to one guy from Siemens. He was presenting uh, some uh, power state uh, uh, sist sist uh, power state estimator. Uh -huh. uh, so he said uh, that uh, the uh, source, uh, the, the heart of uh, of the program, doesn't change. They change uh, only uh, yes. what uh, what a uh, 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 Consument uh, C. So okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And is there any last presenter? Thank you very much. Last presenter. I think that's absent. There's the a, a gentleman from Slavic Republic. Is nobody? Okay. Late gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you all speakers for, for for nice presentations. Thank you for audience for just attendance and for questions. Thank you very much. I close the session. I invite you for the dinner. Thank you very much.
Yes, we can start now the session about electronic measurements. In contrast to all other sessions I managed to attend in this conference, it seems like all set of authors is present. So, therefore, I kindly ask you to follow the agenda and not exceed 15 minutes, because otherwise we'll be uh, late to the coffee break. So 15 minutes, I will somehow try to attract your attention if you're exceeding <laughs> the time allocated for you. So about 12 minutes for presentation and uh, please leave like uh, three minutes for questions and discussions. We will start with the presenter, Slavomir Judek, and his presentation, Wavelet Transform-Based Approach to Detect Identification identification and railway carbon contact strips. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sławomir Judek. I'm from Gdańsk University of Technology, Poland. And I would like to talk about uh, wavelet transform-based approach to defect identification in railway carbon contact strips. Uh, current collector is a main part of uh, a supplying system uh, which conduct energy to movable receiver like electric rail vehicles. Uh, uh, commonly current collector is fitted uh, with two carbon contact strips uh, which slide along the contact wire which is here to provide electrical contact. So, uh, the contact strips are exposure to wear and damages, and so on using damaged contact strips increases the risk of the catenary rupture. So, the technical condition has to be inspected frequent, fr frequently. It depends on uh, uh, overall or current collector or especially for contact strips. Uh, Typical approach to uh, diagnostics of current collectors is time-based preventive maintenance in rolling stock depot. Uh, alternatively way uh, which we uh, prefer is new approach condi uh, called condition-based maintenance which is held on railway line and it's based on inspection points located on the railway lines to perform diagnostic on running vehicles. Here's an example of setup which we uh, propose for diagnostic, diagnostics of current collectors, especially for contact force. Uh, for diagnosis of uh, carbon contact strips, we propose another uh, prototype system which call laser scanning inspection system. Uh, this system was tested on the uh, railway line. The main part of this system is 3D camera and laser line generator. The 3D camera <laughs> uh, makes some uh, uh, w uh, co uh, compared with uh, laser generator uh, makes some measurements and uh, the res received da data uh, have a shape of a matrix which each, each number of this matrix represents height values. And we can use uh, these values for showing uh, it like a normal 2D image but also we can uh, do some visualization in 3D mode. But uh, based on those 3D data, we propose some automatic wear estimation algorithm. Uh, th this algorithm was implemented and tested, uh, and experimental test confirm confirmed good performance of this algorithm. However, we can also observe numerous cases of carbon contact strip defects like this. 
And we observed that our well estimation algorithm is insensitive to shallow defects. So an additional algorithm is necessary for defects detections and identification. If we take into consideration <coughs> data which we have achieved from camera, uh, we proposed uh, an algorithm which is based on differentiation of carbon contact strips height profiles. And we expect that edges of uh, carbon contact strips defects result in the peaks in derivative functions. And those peaks magnitudes depends on the steepness of the edges. So defect identification uh, can be performed by finding the maximums of the derivative module and comparing uh, with some predefined scale established afterwards based on exploitation practice. But uh, some problems may occur because differentiation of the measured profile can be troublesome due to the low signal-to-noise ratio. It can be observed here where we have the result of derivati derivative obtained using difference quotients. Uh, in this situation we have uh, problems which peaks correspond to the damage. So differentiation method has to apply filtering and to be adjusted in such a way to enable the algorithm to accurately estimate both gentle and steep slopes. So we propose solutions based on wavelet transport differentiation algorithms. Algorithm. <coughs> if we look uh, a little bit on theory of wavelet transform, uh, we can use wavelet transform uh, another way. The wavelet transform can be denoted as the nth order derivative of smooth functions over a domain proportional to the rotation parameter A. So we can <coughs> do two things in one way, smoothing and derivative. So to implement evaluation and validation this proposed method, uh, we proposed standardized model of current collectors damages. This is because the shape of usual defects is highly irregular and second reason that the calculation calculating the reference derivative in order to obtain error of the algorithm defined as difference between the estimated and the real derivatives uh, would be troublesome. So we proposed some co-sinusoidal co defect pattern which corresponds to typical Damage, damages which we can observe in uh, real condition. Okay, this uh, pattern is easy to implement and easy to parameter parameterize. Here are some uh, some results. First graph shows trapezoidal shape profile corresponding to a factory new contact strip. We add some defects uh, in cosinusoidal shape. Here we are the same, uh, the, the same profile, but with Gaussian noise, which a level being twice of that registered by uh, laser scanning system. Here we are uh, our pattern derivative obtained analytically, and here we are some results derivatives obtained using wavelet transform for different dilatation parameter A. So we can observe when dilatation parameter is increased, the smoothness of derivatives is increased too, but we lose information <coughs> about values. So it's important to change proper par uh, dilatation parameter A in proper way. <coughs> Also, we uh, try to find relation between error and dilatation parameter A. Uh, regards to uh, various uh, depths and width, widths of the defect. Uh, here are some example results. 
here we are dilatation of uh, while vet transform al algorithm which increases and here we are uh, an error uh, like a difference between between ideal theoretical derivative and uh, estimated through wave length transform algorithm. We can choose some dilatation parameter in such a way that difference between uh, in such a way that the error of calculating on of the maximum of the def uh, derivative defects is in um, between plus minus 50 percent. Additionally, the relation between error and dilatation parameter is monotonous and nonlinear. Uh, and the influence of the damage depth of the error is visible only for low values of parameter A. So to conclude, an approach to automatic carbon contact strips defects identification was proposed. The approach is based on differentiating carbon contact strips profiles and seeking the maximal and minimal derivative. Wavelet transform based algorithm allows for differentiating noisy profiles. The filtering properties depend on a single parameter, which simplifies the pro process of tuning. And detections uh, uh, and rough evaluation of defects does not require very precise derivative estimation. However, a sensible level of, of uncertainty has to be ensured for a wide range of estimated slope rates. So the obtained error of value less than 50% is sufficient to meet the requirements of defects identification. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And any questions to the presenter? Oh yeah, please. That's not a very nice method, but uh, so I wonder if still in the in the in the elevator layway you list graphite since you know that's in my in my knowledge uh, nobody uses graphite. Yes, uh, Everyone uh, use uh, No, that's I don't know the but my, my knowledge about is uh, Russia and uh, we in my, we in mine, for example, use a graphite. And graphite was destroyed very quickly. Yes. After three months we had to change it. They only replaced yes. it by totally it's different materials. It, it, Absolutely it, totally different materials. It, it's correct. Uh, in in European Union the, there are it's some graphite. some uh, <coughs> directives uh, in which is uh, described that everyone who uh, who want to write around the Europe uh, must use the uh, composite graphite and carbon. Yeah. They, they From 11, 12 uh, in Poland, uh, 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 every railway operator uses graphite. Really? Yes. Uh, maybe other questions? If it's not the case, then thank you for presentation. You and uh, well, I would like to invite the second presenter from Czech Republic, David Valla to present his uh, application mining shaft inspection by laser photogrammetry. <coughs> okay. Good afternoon. My name is David Walla and I would like to present our work about the inspection of the mine shaft. It's uh, <coughs> for the introduction. Uh, we are from the Ostrava region and maybe if you don't know where is it, it's on the uh, north uh, east uh, part of the Czech Republic and we had a lot of mine and it was industrial cities for the beginning because maybe uh, someone know uh, someone doesn't know where is it so uh, we are work generally with alternative source of energy but one part of the energy sources in the Czech Republic is still black hole so it's very very in important for us to uh, especially when mine is closed uh, to be able to uh, protect and uh, check the uh, condition of the mines because uh, it's uh, it's very very mm, uh, big problem if it's uh, if you take some material from the ground it's 
some empty space. Okay? And finally, uh, when you don't observe what happened inside, you don't measure the geometry of the mine shaft and so on, it's, you can uh, be in the problem like in the uh, Russian when some ground falls down and it makes a big hole in the, in the ground. So, in this case, uh, we designed uh, uh, new methods for the inspection of the mining shaft uh, based on the photogrammetry. We, can, uh, we choose from the several methods how to measure the profile, because in fact, if you want to measure some hole, some shaft, you measure the profile of the shaft. Uh, one of the uh, methods is, uh, sorry, uh, it's a scanning by the uh, laser profile scanner, but it's uh, generally designed for the line measurement, for the measurement of the profiles uh, for the industrial application mostly. <laughs> Another uh, system for the measure of the geometry is the stereo photogrammetry, the newest two cameras, and uh, you need good light condition for the measurement because uh, uh, to, to have the good contrast for the image to processing you must know uh, we must find the same point of two different pictures so it's very difficult in the mind where it's dark okay? so you must add uh, a lot of light so it's problem because you need big uh, light sources and and so on another task is using the single shot photogrammetry and if you take the from the dark makes them not disadvantage but advantage because everything is dark inside so it's easily to uh, to make the light cut plane to find the points from the one cameras because it works on, on this principle like it's line scanners like it's in these pictures you have the one angle of the uh, cutting uh, light planes and the cameras and then you can calculate uh, the position of the each point and it's very clearly defined where the point is it's uh, much more much more simple and faster this algorithm for it than using the stereo photogrammetry because in the stereo photogrammetry we have a real two image but uh, in the single light cutting plane uh, single shot photogrammetry we have only the line to processing it's much more times less data to process so uh, you can see the device which is used for the measurement. It's uh, generally divided to two parts. One part is the camera system. It's, uh, you can use a high resolution camera. It doesn't matter if it's a classic uh, steel camera, digital steel camera, or another type of the camera, depend on the sp uh, spectral so sensitivity and so on. And on the bottom part is the uh, devising for the making the light uh, light cutting plate it's uh, uh, in the in the first prototype we're using the some system with the uh, xenon flash and so on it's uh, it has uh, good uh, properties uh, but uh, it's several disadvantage for the uh, for the uh, xenon light because you need high voltage for the in itself the flash and, and it's a little bit danger in the mine shaft. So, uh, generally, we make a most advanced part in this uh, bottom part of the uh, of of the measurement uh, equipment, and it's to switch uh, a switch to laser system. Uh, maybe you know the photogrammetry generally. I don't know if you're familiar or not with the system, uh, but uh, basing, uh, we're taking a picture and then uh, we would like to compute the uh, properties or dimension, exactly dimension of the shaft. It's very uh, imp important the uh, whole distortion because if you remove the materials, it's not only the hole to the ground, but you have uh, many, many horizontal uh, uh, tun tunnels in the, in the shaft. Yeah. So, uh, if this uh, sorry, if this geometry, it's not uh, in uh, some tolerance, it's problem because lift in the shaft uh, could break or uh, could be still inside somewhere, or it could be danger for for the people and for the uh, technology too. So, uh, from the data, we can, uh, from the capture data, we we measure generally the. Uh, the whole, whole distortion can uh, compute the geometry 
on the each plane and make uh, finally 3D models, which is uh, on the next slide. And uh, what is very, very interesting for us is uh, changing and conversion during the times. It's not measure one time and never more. It's necessary to measure daily, on the daily basis, not exactly daily, by the periodical, by the week, the months, depend on the, how the rock massive is movement. It's depend on the each location, because uh, each location has some specific uh, properties of the ground materials and so on. So, uh, it's not a very clear view, but if you are in the mind, uh, it's like this. We have not many light, it, and only uh, you can f find a few points and must compute uh, position. So, uh, if you would like to classic st uh, stereography, it's very big problem to find and fix the same point because it's depend of the angle of the uh, impact of the light to the materials and so on. It's a very big. Uh, big problem to find the same point. But with the laser we can make the uh, uh, good, uh, good cutting plate. Okay. Generally, big problem with the uh, humidity and uh, uh, coal powder or the some another small particle in the air which is problem with the measurement because it's desert and if you if you put the light to the some small particle and reflect and so it's next problem with the uh, optical method but uh, in the single shot photogrammetry you eliminate many points because you know that it's uh, wrong in the wrong place exactly so it's uh, one of the our prototype we, we switch from the xenon tube to the laser system, we use uh, several la uh, laser module on the on the basic plane, and uh, add some equipment like the battery, power supply, and so on to uh, to be able to light on and control the light uh, how you need uh, when uh, when the, this equipment go through the mining shaft. Okay. So. One advantage is that we can control the intensity of light. We can control the uh, duration of the flash, or it could be continuous on this laser, which is unable to do with the xenon flash. It's a uh, lower voltage, so uh, uh, it's not so big problem with high voltage and intrinsic safety problems. And again, it's a uh, uh, shock resistance because it's not. Uh, not a very critical or mechanical critical part inside. So we base this uh, system control system on the small chip from my uh, from Nordic semiconductors with uh, radio communication uh, transceiver inside uh, to communicate with the upper part uh, uh, with the camera and. Uh, it's uh, uh, <coughs> like I said before. It can control the intensity, length of the flash, and another or multi flash uh, with uh, with the laser. It's not exactly flash because it's only the switch on, switch off the lasers. Yeah, <coughs> but it's for sure time we can say it's it's a close to flash. So wireless synchronization it's a uh, one advantage is you have no cable between two devices so it's uh, easily to mount it uh, before or uh, uh, under the lift yeah. and uh, easily you can reprogram it and uh, take data about the condition of the battery and so on and uh, this uh, solution is patented in the Czech Republic we are, we are not uh, uh, patents in Europe and so on because it's in the Europe it's more mine it's close so maybe in the Poland it's interesting but uh, we, we cooperate with the university in the Poland so and when we have data we can compute and make reconstruction of the uh, model of the shaft and after reconstruction we can compare the original or projected um, properties and the geometry of the shaft with actual measurement and can find some distortion and some changes during the time in the shaft. It's, uh, it's very in, uh, interesting in the maintenance and uh, 
especially when the mine is closed, the, some mines must be still on, or the mining shaft because you need the taking uh, taking the water from the from the mines to protect another mines in the region because if you stop uh, pumping water from the ground, it's another mine. It's uh, it's fruit. So it's a um, it's problem in the Ostrava region, Ostrava Karvina region, or to the Katowice, uh, because all the ground it's uh, interconnect between. So if on the one side of the boundary they stop uh, pumping waters, of all, all the mines will be fruit. So it, it's a big problem. Uh, okay. For the future, uh, we work on the interesting safety because uh, probably if you know the problematic of the uh, coal mining, it's a big problem with methane in coal mining. Uh, longer battery life is uh, it's, uh, on the uh, working with the okay, battery itself and also the most effective uh, light sources because they have different effectivity depend on the manufacture of the light, uh, laser diodes and so on. Uh, because it's a for the really hard environment, uh, we must a little bit improve the mechanical design of all uh, equipment because it's a very, very raw uh, industry. And also we work to real-time processing because now it's uh, close to offline processing. Uh, we're making the pictures, then it go to process. In the future, we would like to be processing the online to automatically it know <coughs> it could be still uh, mounted under the uh, mine lift and uh, it could be by on the daily basis we have actualization of the data. So it's, it's good for the statistics and so on. I'm not Gaelog, so for me it's only the measurement. It must some uh, and other people to process the data and say what is wrong. Okay, it was short introduction to our problematics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for well timed presentation. Before we have uh, questions. questions. We are just from the Institute of the, the Mining Industry. That's uh, <laughs> very interesting <laughs> things. Okay. Uh, could you uh, tell me uh, what, what kind of light do you use? Infrared or just visible light? Uh, we, uh, we try to using the good of them. Uh, but uh, because uh, the chip for the camera chip, it's a better work for us in the visible light. Visible. We, we're using the red laser, but uh, we think about using the uh, multicolor laser and have uh, V or three uh, uh, spectral uh, scan for to be able to increase the resol not resolution but uh, recognition of the points because uh, sometimes it's some, uh, in the shaft it's some light sources and so it's, it's disturbed a little bit measurement. But if we, we can switch it, uh, multi, uh, control switch the uh, multicolor laser or something like this, it's not exactly multicolor, it must be three or more lasers. Infrared laser, uh, it doesn't use now uh, because it's, um, it's a little bit problem uh, to buy it uh, with those, uh, with, uh, uh, properties which we need for our experiments, but in the future it's uh, no problem to improve it and testing with uh, with this uh, way. Right, uh, but what's the kind of data transmission? It's a young user. Why are the time? If you can uh, just already uh, already uh, we store it in the we store it inside. You take it out. Yeah, and then uh, I don't know where. It, yeah, in this upper place, we store the data, uh -huh. and the data from the microcontroller we uh -huh. store inside, and then it synchronizes it uh -huh. between, and then after uh, after it go up and uh, remove it, we we in, in uh, we take off the memory cards and download data. Oh, okay. Okay. It's not I, I like say it's not real online today. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm it's saying, the pro saying. processing. It's short, but it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. If there are any. Other questions? I will be short question from my side. About the size of data you collect, I know several people in our country working with uh, fuel tanks uh, volume uh, measurement using similar yeah. methods. They say the it's amount of data collected is uh, pretty huge. Yeah. Is yeah. This is the case in a because shaft is long. Yeah, it's, it's very long. But the resolution is uh, 
the vertical resolution is not uh, per millimeters, yeah? it's, it's approximately in order of tens of the centimeters or half, uh, uh, up to two meters, because the problem is that it's mount belong the uh, mine lift. And it had some uh, limiting the speed of the moving, because if you stop it, it's not, not good for the measurement because add some more errors. Uh, because we compute uh, um, horizontal position, uh, vertical position from the lift yeah, today. And we can add another pressure sensor and someone, but it's uh, today we using this position. When you have the lift and you stop it, it has some dynamical change of the uh, of the rope of the cable uh, where is the lift mount, and it's it's add more error. So the best way is to go continuously down and uh, making the some slice. Of the and then uh, compare it and putting to the correct position. So, uh, in fact, uh, we use the standard memory card for the processing, and it's in order in gigabytes the data yeah, to, to the processing. But because we're using only the uh, cutting the light, it's not we not process all image, but only the specific segment of the image, which is much more faster than than uh, compute the whole image. But today it's possible, but. Again, it, it's uh, this one. It's uh, beginning for the online processing, which you have not so much computing power. Okay. Thank you. Thank you then for presentation <laughs> again. And our uh, next presenter is Wojciech Valenciuk. His presentation is evaluation of PT hundred sensor deflection effect during strain measurement. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to say a few words about uh, platinum sensors. Uh, during our experiments, we have um, a lot of errors um, of temperature measurement, and we realized that errors uh, source is deflection of the sensor during our experiments. That is why uh, we uh, started to examination of uh, this effect as an experiment. Uh, so the main aim of this experiment is, is to examine influence of deflection of the platinum sensors uh, on their resistance changes. So you know um, sensor, uh, platinum sensor, uh, sensor um, works as a kind of resistor. Its resistance is changing uh, uh, caused by temperature. Yes, if the temperature increase, resistance I increases. But if we apply such a sensor to a deflected element, tank, for example, uh, uh, or cantilever beam, uh, the resistance changes too. So, uh, as you see on the bottom, we have different kinds of shapes of uh, paths on the uh, platinum on the ceramic uh, background. So we examined two kinds of sensors, smaller one and bigger, in order to, to see what is the difference of uh, resistant in resistant changes uh, caused by deflection. The properties of the sensor are the same, but the shape and the sizes are different. We have built a laboratory stand in order to achieve rep repetitiveness of uh, uh, results. Uh, we have cantilever beam, a heater in order to change temperature. Uh, we have uh, also step motor controller, micromet uh, micrometer, electronic micrometer with a serial interface, and uh, of course data acquisition card and some sensors placed on the cantilever beam. Uh, how the laboratory stand was uh, steered and controlled by with the use of LabVIEW uh, program. So we have cantilever beam uh, of this size, step motor controller, micrometer with a serial interface, national instruments, data acquisition card. Uh, we have used four wire um, for wire connection in order to to um, to see what is the resistance 
of the sensor, of course, LabVIEW as a data acquisition program. And additionally, in order to see what is the temperature distribution on the cantilever beam, we have used thermal imaging camera. Here you can see a simple state machine. Um, in such a way, we uh, prepared a program in order to, to do a measurement process as an, as an automatic. We only apply some um, properties in this program and whole process of measurement is automatic. Here you can see a uh, panel of the steering panel. We can define, of course, um, a way of deflection of the cantilever beam and um, we can see results. Of course, results are stored uh, on the hard disk. We have additional panel in order to check if all the sensors are working correctly. It's an additional one uh, tab. First of all, we have checked if the thermal distribution is, uh, has a uniform uh, style, uniform temperature dis distribution on the cantilever beam. Here you can see a uh, heater and on the next, in the next slide you will see what is the temperature if the temperature is uniform. Here you can see an, in a visible light what is the structure of the uh, measurement sensors, how the sensors are placed. Here we can see maybe more. Uh, we have placed small one, platinum sensor, bigger one, ther thermocouple sensor, in order to check temperature. Of course, we can see here, uh, maybe not see, we can have here a heater. And uh, additionally, over there, there is a place strain gog sensor. Strain gog sensor is a a resistance sensor in, um, which are we, we are using to, uh, to measure deflection. Of course we can measure a strain. In order to minimize uh, convection uh, air flow, um, a, mass air, ma a mass transfer effect, we have covered all the um, measurement system, maybe not exactly whole, but the part of the uh, system, by a cubic, uh, cubical box. In such a way, um, there is no influence or of uh, air which are, you know, around the, the laboratory stand. In this slide we can see results. Maybe we cannot see results because we can we have uh, exact values achieved uh, during uh, uh, our uh, measurement process. In order to see what is the difference between initial values to the other um, values during our measurement, we have to use a measure like that. Like that. So we have an initial value and we mm, uh, calculated difference between actual value to the to the initial value. For a small sensor we can see that uh, temperature uh, that um, deflection um, effect is not so huge but we, if we look at the huge sensor B, this one, we can see that deflection has an influence on the resistance of the sensor. Of course, we can see, but um, the differences for different uh, temperatures. Um, it is uh, caused by uh, increases of resistance sensor for a bigger uh, temperatures. So the um, coefficient of difference is bigger. Here you can see. Uh, <coughs> for a 20 degrees of relation uh, in comparison to the strain gog sensor. It, it, so was, it was a uh, 120 ohms sensor. As you can see, the um, tem uh, deflection influence is quite maybe four times smaller than 
a strain gauge sensor, which is constructed for measurement strain. For a bigger temperature, 60 degrees, you can see that um, uh, effect of uh, resistance changing is quite the same like strain gauge sensor. That is why we have, we can say that uh, experiments uh, mm, show us that we have to be aware about placing of sensors. We have to place a sensor in a pro appropriate uh, places which are not deflected. Of course, we can use different kind of sensors, smaller one, but we have to be aware about it. We have to know that is an influence on t uh, of deflection to the sensor of temperature. So, I think it's a main conclusion to this uh, mm, to this uh, presentation. So we can discuss it uh, more if you have any question. Yes. Some questions to continue with this presentation. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's interesting, interesting information. It's but it seems that uh, similarity to the uh, like you measure like a strain gauge. Yeah. Strain gauge is also very sensitive to temperature. Therefore, he measure is strange, but also sensitive to the temperature. And you have compensate influence of temperature. It's a similar situation, like just opposite. Uh -huh. You measure temperature, and you have to compensate the stress. Probably you will have to apply two such a, such a measurement probes to do that. Oh, <laughs> we have started to apply uh, such a sensor in order to measure temperature and strain. Go with the we, we have applied such a kind of sensor to our circuit, uh, uh -huh. which is based on uh, double current uh, uh -huh. uh, supply. First was a strain gauge, and the other one was temperature sensor as a PT100. Uh -huh. uh -huh. And in our experiments, during deflection, we have a lot of errors of measurement a proper, uh, proper value of temperature. That is why we have started this examination. What exactly happened? And of course we can see in this picture... No, no I don't question your okay. problem. This problem is very important. It's some problem but you don't understand my question. You know. The problem is that there is a serious problem. That's really, you are absolutely right. It depends on the size of this probe. Yes. The longer is the size of the... And deflection is pretty high for you. It's pretty high. It's about 12, 15 millimeters. Is pretty yes. High deflection, you know. That's However, this such a possibility is my my question is that the similar problem like you measure, for example, stress, and also you have to compensate temperature. Yes. In this case, you measure temperature and you have to compensate influence of stress. Yes. Yes. That. Yes. But yes. yes. Is very good. But it's opposite. Yes, you have right. Thank. Yeah, uh, to, to to rephrase that discussion, you have in mind the idea how to correct when you are obvious of the problem. But you will soon come with a proposal how to uh, correct the measurement results. I they think are still it's not it's presented. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's hard to correct such a, such a sensor because um, an influence of temperature is much uh, more bigger than the uh, strain. So you only you can I think you can use only smaller sensors or different kinds. But you have to watch. You have to be aware where can I place my sensor, on which part of the machine, for example. And this is uh, what you not always can choose freely. Perhaps <laughs> yeah. the uh, construction of the machine le leaves you a single opportunity to insert that sensor. But so you can use another one, not this, not big, not huge. Not you can use smaller one or different kind. That's clear. Um, if there are any other questions, if no, then thank you once again. <laughs> and we then could move to the next presentation by Lukas Makovsky, Low Cost Laboratory Stand for Turbidity Measurements. Okay, thank you, Mr. Turner, for introducing me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me share my humble experience from my pet project, which was to uh, create a test bed for uh, development and research in area of uh, turbidity measurements. Uh, 
This is my pet project, so not my uh, main uh, background, not my uh, main area of interest, which is distributed measurement systems and wireless sensor networks. But over time, when I was working in some projects, I became interested in details, not the huge uh, view of the design of the system, not the software engineering, which, has which I was doing before, but the detail. And the detail was uh, turbidity measurement. Why turbidity? First of all, because it's one of the key parameters with which uh, one can assess quality of uh, clean water or the tap water or, or some other water. Uh, secondly, because it's one of the few parameters that can be measured with just electrical or optoelectronic methods. Other uh, water uh, parameters, factors, need to, uh, to be measured with uh, some chemical sensors or chemical methods that are applicable only in lab laboratory, like spectrophotometry, which is not available in situ. So my, uh, my set of goals or my main goal is to create a test bed with which I will be able to create a, to build a, a wireless sensor network module that is designed to measure turbidity. Of course, uh, one may ask why to build if one can buy, of course, there are uh, nice and shiny devices available on the market, like this Hachlange laboratory uh, turbidity me uh, measurement device. They are a bit costly, perhaps. 1,000 euros for one, um, one wireless sensor network node is too much. And uh, it's rather hard to applicate it to wireless sensor network. So no fun included in this device. Another choice, uh, which I was using myself, is uh, uh, in situ probe from EC. These probes are uh, quite large, I mean uh, one meter uh, of the tube. Uh, this is the length of this tube, which costs uh, itself 1,000 euros more or less. Each sensor, which you can see attached to the tube, uh, costs uh, probably the same, so the, this is quite expensive. We used uh, uh, two such probes uh, on one leg and this was, uh, this was costly. So I was started to think, uh, does it have to be so expensive? Could I do it uh, properly with less money? And so that's why be I became interested in this uh, turbidity measurements. How to measure turbidity? Perhaps you are familiar with the method. It's really simple. Uh, we have a light source which illuminates a, a sample. Uh, the sample contains particles which, uh, uh, which affect the light. So part of the light uh, comes directly onto the other side. It passes through the sample. Uh, it is attenuated, so if we measure this attenuated li uh, light, attenuation level indicates how much particles are in the sample. This is due to lambert beer law, perhaps you know. lambert uh, law says that the length of the mm, path in the, in the sample uh, causes the at attenuation, so the longer the path, the bigger attenuation. If, the, if we have a probe like this that has a stable dimension, uh, this uh, has no uh, impact. And the beer law says that the amount of particles in the sample uh, cause that, uh, cause that uh, scattering of the light. If you measure the scattered light, this is the nephelometric method. Now I'm working on turbidimetric method, so I measure the light that goes through the sample. Uh, if you don't know uh, that uh, turbidity is measured in nephelometric turbidity units, just for your attention, I work in the range from about 800 to close to zero NTU, so pretty opaque to completely translucent uh, deionized water, which is the range uh, of the waters you can expect in natural environment. So, I was able to, do, to create requirements for a new device. First of all, I had to leave my uh, safety zone to learn something new, to think out, outside my previous experiences, so I needed some courage, first of all. Then a light source, preferably a laser, because lasers are fun, lasers have coherent light, lasers are easy to couple into a narrow beam. Then a tank, a cuvette, well, uh, something better than plastic bottle, uh, a spectrophotometric cuvette would be the best, and finally uh, some light detector. As you may guess, uh, cats are the best uh, detectors of laser spots, but we need something more reliable, I mean some optoelectronics. So here is my uh, layout of my laboratory stand. Uh, main components, main parts are on the bottom. Here is optical breadboard to which a laser and a cuvette are attached, plus some additional equipment. By the fiber, there is a transducer attached. Why the fiber? Because I'm thinking about uh, 
about wireless node device that can work in situ. And I don't want to submerge my transducer in some lake water. I want to float it onto the surface, but measure under the surface, few meters under the surface. So I'm starting to use fiber already now. Uh, I was observing if transducer works properly with oscilloscope and multimeter, but actually the data was transferred from analog signal, voltage signal to digital value, and then transferred wirelessly with XB link to PC, where it was further processed and where I was creating some uh, graphs. My laser model is 660 nanometers, so visible red light. I was avoiding intentionally uh, infrared light, first of all, because I was afraid of the infrared, of this power, like uh, 80 milliwatts, and secondly, this this is cheaper uh, choice. The visible lasers are, are much cheaper. QVET, like this, uh, <coughs> more or less. Here is uh, what I had to do. I need. Uh, I had to cut corners because I had. Uh, it was my pet project, so I had little budget, and I couldn't afford a proper kinematic mount for laser, which could easily dwarf my whole project. So I had to find out some other solution, and it became uh, clear that thing that is used by amateur astronomers who 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 also use lasers to um, as a finders that to aim for specific star is good enough for my project. So, I mean, it requires a lot of patience and some recalibrations over the time, but it can hold laser and uh, with this I can aim the laser towards the, the fiber at the other end. Here is the uh, view of the breadboard, cuvette in the middle, perhaps you can see that light is uh, actually scattering in the sample. Uh, here are uh, posts with uh, with uh, pinholes and polarizers. Polarizers were, ju uh, were used just to attenuate the light prior to, to enter, uh, prior mm, before it entered the sample because 80 milliwatts uh, for some samples was uh, too much. At the other end, on the uh, on your right side, you can see the, the red spot, which is entrance of the fiber. By the fiber, the, the signal, the, the, the light is transferred to transducer, which is on the far right, perhaps it's a bit dark uh, from the beamer, but here it is. The heart of the transducer is uh, OPT101 uh, photodiode. Maybe you are familiar with this chip because it's for a long time on the market. It's easy to use. It has large area, uh, large sensitive area, so easy to aim uh, the, the light towards this, uh, this photodiode. And finally, it has uh, uh, embedded uh, amplifier, so there is no need to, to worry about how to connect amplifier with uh, photodiode and avoid the, all these uh, strain capacitances. Uh, I created some simple, uh, simple device, simple uh, board uh, based on the OPT101, several uh, resistors to change gain, uh, output uh, through the uh, unit gain amplifier as it should be done, uh, there is also a possibility to change reference level, which means that ambient light should equal uh, zero volts at output. When laser is off, we should have zero volts at output. But there is always some ambient light, also, uh, which also affects the, the photodiode, so there is a uh, possibility to change this reference level. This is uh, how it looks assembled in uh, open enclosure. The green board in the middle was, uh, was uh, what, what I constructed. And OPT11 in the middle, some components on the other side, of course, uh, SMT included. Knobs to change gain, uh, to change reference level. Board is attached to XB uh, development board, uh, which samples the, the, the value and transfers it to PC. With this, I was able to uh, to manage to, to create uh, uh, calibration curves based on uh, three standard solutions which I bought from chemical company. These solutions are traceable to Polish national standards, so quite reliable, uh, but I had to dilute them myself. So this 200 NTU I had to dilute uh, to, to, to lower uh, turbidities, and you can see two gains over here one should be twice as uh, much as the other, and it is so, so probably it works. Another sample, uh, an example that, uh, that my dilution process was probably correct, as I started with 800 NTU and 500 NTU, and these two curves uh, correspond to each other on both ranges. So it means that my K1 
chemical procedures, I'm not a chemist, but my chemical procedures in diluting were correct. And conclusions. Simple turbidimeter is quite easy to build, so it shouldn't be so expensive. It should be more affordable. It should be easier to create a wireless sensor network with many turbidimeters. For example, in rural areas where people often has, uh, have their own uh, source of water, local source of water, which uh, usually not is as much reliable as uh, the water sources in cities, or they are so remote from the uh, water treatment, uh, water conditioning, that their water might be contaminated and above the, uh, the threshold of uh, required standards. So this is what I'm trying to develop in the next few months, a probe that will be, uh, that will be applicable in situ or into pipe. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Some questions in the audience. They're looking at me. That's, <laughs> yes, that's, that's interesting work, you know, that's, uh, but I'm not wrong. You try to check the, the, the transparency of this, of the water, right? Transparency mm. of no, no, what it is? Uh, to, well, we say usually transmittance. Transmittance. Which is uh, corresponding to absorbance. Yeah. So, so uh, 100% transmittance is uh, no absorbance, okay. as you can see here. Uh, we should work uh, between 10% uh, of transmitters okay. up to 100. You are based on reflected light. Scattering right. scatter, uh, scatter, problem. I'm not measuring scattered light yeah, because I'm it would be a nephelometry which uh, brings a different set of problems. For, exam for example, uh, these particles do not scatter the light in all, direct in all directions, right. but there are some <coughs> minimas and maximas. Right. So I preferred to uh, to measure the light directly in the beam path uh, to use turbidimetry. Uh -huh, okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, small question from my side. What are the disturbing factors in your measurement? Let's say, does that depend on the temperature of the, mm. uh, of the, the liquids? The main problem in, uh, in such measurements is calibration and uh, reliability of the calibration samples. Even the experienced companies like Hachlange say, for example, that creating a dilution up to or less than 5 NTU is almost impossible uh, in, uh, in most of the laboratories. So the, the calibration procedure is the most problematic uh, thing here. As usual in chemical measurements, Preparation yes, but of that uh, reference material and its handling. Uh, I'm just trying to create a device and uh, ask someone else to calibrate it because when it works, it can be calibrated. Of course, calibration curves can be created uh, in some better laboratory than I have, and it will still work. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> okay, now we will have um, Mr. Chen. China, giving a real Eastern flavor to this our Eastern European yeah. <laughs> measurement session, and his uh, presentation is fabrication of long and smooth tungsten probes for nano manipulation. Good afternoon. <coughs> uh, I'm my name is. Ch I'm from China. Uh, my university is Huazhong University of Science and Technology. It's located in the middle China, Wuhan, <coughs> Hubei province. <coughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and my <coughs> presentation is included in the four parts. First, uh, first one is the introduction. Below, there is a great need for large scale problems. Large scale problems as the end factor to manipulate a nano object and a nano structure. But the, the chemical atomic force microscope problem is a good choice. Due to its uh, have the ultra sharp tips, whose diameter could be could be ten 
nanometers, such as this picture shows. And uh, <coughs> this one, this white line is just uh, the broken and uh, adhere to the <coughs> substrate. But the auto make for the microscope have two disadvantages for the nano many pionation. The first one is there is a fixed angle seed from here and the tip. It is the, the kind of never under the tip. And the <coughs> second one is the tip is the proper is easy to broken to be broken at the end sorry at the root <coughs> so the researchers want to find another prob kind alternative alternated uh, a automatic force microscope okay. the town stand <laughs> scan internal microscope <coughs> problems could be uh, alternative to this as with its diameters of 20 nanometers and straight assays such as this picture shows and uh, his is sm smallness at edge is uh, <coughs> almost uh, 10 mi million meters and but uh, at the tip it is not a good choice and the, so many researchers in the world have found a electro chemical Aging method is just uh, like the this chemical equation shows the tungsten it is two O H and two water then the tungsten like this but the concentration grant the concentration gradient of the <coughs> Or the organ, organ the dragon in the many screws, many screws just here, just like this, and can become this many screws, and the shading effect <coughs> makes the problems with sharp, it is potent Q, have for Q, and uh, just like see this just. The 10 million meters. So we <laughs> promote a dynamic electrochemical aging method to, to fabricate the proper wear. How to do this? We give the tungsten wear a picking up speed. Do when it's emission in the canum solution, and the the mentioned skills is stressed here, is changed, and the, the shading effect of the this anion layers is decreased, so it's. Uh, make the x point q uh, decreased too, <laughs> and uh, to by this way, a long and smooth tongue stand problem with a constant gradient could be fabricated. <laughs> Just like this, and uh, we can see the, during the picking up the tongue stand problem. Have the exit point Q here is gone. 
and uh, <coughs> the whole pro probable manufacturing system <laughs> including two parts. Uh, one is the mechanic part and another one is electric part. <laughs> this picture is, is our real experiment uh, system. <laughs> and uh, during the experiment, there were a sharp drop <laughs> of the the parameter i, and uh, it means the it means the fabrication is done. And uh, how to do this? The flow chart like this, <laughs> doing uh, several steps in here, we can judge if the tungsten of the electron net, if if then if done, they will appear a sharp drop. It means the fabrication is done. <laughs> there are five processing methods. Sorry, it's uh, maybe it's uh, four. <laughs> In the dynamic electric chemical each method for this tungsten fabricate. This is concentration and the Each in wattage, the three hold wattage and the picking up speed and the, the emission dips. The the last two picking up speed and the emission dips depend on each other during our experiment. Experiment. So we can call is the four parameters. And uh, the several <coughs> experiments were performed to investigate the relationship between the four process parameters and the three outcomes. It's the opaque diameters and uh, the aspect ratio of the progress. The other one is how long we can is consume. <coughs> the first one we can see <coughs> the concentration is the solution's concentration, how to influence the <coughs> three outcomes. <coughs> this chart <coughs> we can see this is the first one we had see have seen Three outcomes is uh, our packaged diameters, and uh, this is our packaged <coughs> ratio, and uh, this one is consuming time. <coughs> we <coughs> use the th three different lines to get the price, <coughs> the, the result, <coughs> and we can see <coughs> at the vertical lines, right. It's the proper interval. <coughs> this is the concentration. It means <coughs> the optimal concentration is uh, two more per nature. The second <coughs> influence is uh, of the each one that we also in investigate. <coughs> See from the, the chef these three outcomes, how to be influenced by, by what? By the aging voltage. We found the aging voltage is between three watt and eight watt is, is the proper interview. And the second, <coughs> The second <coughs> parameter is the threshold voltage. <coughs> it influences the three, three outcomes like this. 
we found this is the proper interview. It's about 380 microwatt to 400 microwatt. During this interview, we can get better outcomes. See, f see from the 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 uh, had three parameters, and the last one is the picking up speed. We also do some experiment to see this, and uh, we get the conclusion is that the optimum picking up speed range is about 2.2 <laughs> micrometers per second and the and 3.2 micrometers per second this is all four <laughs> parameters how to influence the three outcomes and uh, see from the the four scan chart we found this curve is changed a little. Do you see this? It's almost, it means what? Means the aspect ratio is something have nothing to do, seems have nothing to do with the four parameters. Yeah, Alara said is no relationship with the four parameters. And uh, the other two or packets diameters and the consuming times are all influenced by or uh, another side is determined by the four parameters. And uh, how to control them? You we had we are get a good result. So far, there's not a firm formula to forecast and calculate the length of the probe person. I, we, uh, maybe it's the further research. And uh, the use of the fabricated probes for the nano manipulation is the a probe was used to bend a nano wire. This this picture is photoed by us during the experiment. And uh, another tweezer, another tweezer, uh, constraint used two such probes was used to left nano wires. This is the trial, the and uh, we can zoom in this like this, and then I can have our con conclusions. In summary, a dynamic electrochemical aging uh, sorry, I can't uh, aging system for long and smooth tungsten proper fabrication was developed and the mechanism of the electrochemical aging problems are uh, discussed and for independent process parameters which affect the opaque diameters and the aspect ratio of the problem and the consuming time were also investigated and optimized with the, this process per parameter Com combination, the aspect ratio of the probe were more than eight, <laughs> and the opaque diameter were less than 200 nanometers. <laughs> it's uh, compared with the 10 nanometers with uh, item ATM probes is longer more longer than that. And thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for the presentation, which convinced me that in nanoscale we cannot talk in separate about chemistry and mechanics. They are all together. Maybe audience would like to ask a question. Uh, then a short question from my side is, I was wondering how do you implement that slow movement, microseconds, micrometers per second, oh. like uh, uh, picking up? Picking up. Just like this, this is a twizer. You know, to control this, <coughs> with, there's a microscope. And uh, how to control these two tips is uh, here. Is uh, changed uh, this distance changed uh, by the temperature. Mm -hmm. We can give the okay, temperature so the high and I now see. to control this. It see, so you change the temperature, it yeah. uh, transforms the object and then moves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the temperature, they really can change see. slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't uh, to use your hand. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank thank you. You. Thank you. Um, okay. I will try to conclude this session myself. By presenting our uh, quite easy analysis of smart power sockets implementation, we are from Kaunas University of Technology, and we saw these uh, so-called smart power sockets, or sometimes they are regarded like outlets or plugs, became a quite popular and really affordable instrument in the era of uh, Internet of Things. and. Uh, Quite a lot of articles, though not very far ago, within a range of two or three years, were published, a variety of implementations, and we made an attempt to give some overview, as well as our uh, investigation and our implementations. So these electronic devices are mainly aimed to uh, conduct several uh, tasks, to measure electrical power consumption at the every point of electrical power consumption and support remote mainly wireless though it could be a power line communication control of loads on and off and of course reading of measurement results the fields of application of these power sockets is power monitoring and management home automation load control consumption profile monitoring and of course internet of things is still looking for more applications hopefully to boost in the near future the architecture of power socket mainly mimics the uh, structure of ordinary electric power meter though there are significant restrictions on the implementation mainly about the dimensions because that power socket we want to be as small as possible or even better to fit to fit it inside the wall where the wires are connected nowadays electronics uh, these small size and low power components nearly do allow which we convinced ourselves by assembling several prototypes to achieve this minimization of uh, dimensions of that measurement instrument. So the power supply, wireless connectivity module, uh, control module, which is, uh, uh, of course, nowadays small embedded microprocessor, measurement module, and load control module, which is, has a load connected at its output. After overviewing all these implementations and reports by um, some startup companies, we convinced ourselves that there are several challenges quite little addressed. And we uh, attempt to target them in this our investigation. And the key thing, mainly these developers get involved in wireless connectivity, but they forget or underestimate the measurement issue, uh, measurement uncertainty, 
and especially in the whole measurement range. If you read about these articles, you can easily find that they say the error is 1%, but they never state in which range, which is uh, at least not correct. Uh, a lot of applications target measurement of uh, standby powers, quite small powers, which exposed in a long period, they attribute quite significantly to the whole power consumption and finally bills of the consumer. And the energy efficiency of that socket itself, if its goal is to measure and finally save power or uh, give a facilitation to various policies, implementation of these saving policies, so the device itself should be as efficient as uh, possible itself, because it will be running all a long time, the whole time, the whole day, and uh, even if the load is disconnected, that measurement instrument will consume power. This issue is also quite uh, often uh, underestimated. We did an overview and list in this table a scenario of possible implementations, bearing in mind structural elements of the uh, measurement, wireless connectivity and control, shown in the previous or several slides ago. Uh, power measurement calculation, wireless connectivity and control. So in one or other manner, embedded microcontroller is involved, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, we were unable to find a system on chip, a semiconductor chip, which implements everything in a single chip. Uh, energy measurement, well, the programmable controller itself, and a transceiver, wireless transceiver. The combinations do exist. I'm not going to uh, uh, analyze in very detail this uh, table, but the conclusion that you could easily come from this that there is either transceiver and microcontroller or microcontroller and so-called specialized DSP uh, aimed for measuring power consumption. So power consumption is measured by sensing current and voltage and then processing in a digital signal processing manner. So no uh, single chip at the moment present in the market. Hopefully it can be uh, done by uh, manufacturers, but not at the moment. Therefore, for the designers, there is always a challenge which parts to uh, select for either wireless and processor or uh, measurement processor coupled with the ordinary processor and connect wireless things, wireless transceiver as a separate uh, component on the PCB board of the smart power socket. I said I will uh, uh, no, not going to talk about wireless connectivities. They are, um, especially in the Internet of Things related literature, covered a bit more in detail and diverse applications. And I allow myself to remind the current and voltage sensing in the smart socket prototypes. Mainly we have uh, voltage sensing options like resistive divider and transformer. As for the current sensing is shunt resistor, current transformer. And recently we have quite small so offers from our available chips with a very little size based on hole effect. And they give us uh, an opportunity to opt or galvanic isolation of uh, power circuits from measurement circuits. Therefore, in our investigation, we selected that a whole sensor and then it was transformed for voltage sensing. They both are connected to separate channels from to analog to digital converter with the appropriate filtering and level shifting from uh, analog preconditioning of the signals before they are sampled and uh, discretized. Quite often used microcontroller is MSP430 from Texas Instruments. The active power estimation we in uh, this initial study target only active power, not dealing with reactive power. And the formula is quite classical. 
where we multiply voltage sample and the average of two adjacent uh, current samples in order because there is no uh, dual analog to digital converters there is one converter multiplexed in time so to reduce mm -hmm. errors that is well known quite long ago and patented by TI formula where we take an average of two uh, current samples and the voltage sample and they if we come back to the analog then uh, current and voltage that we sample before substituting to the formula which is calculated by the processor software we have gains of the channels of the measurement channels from uh, from the real current and voltage uh, so gains we then have uh, voltage at the input of current and voltage channels that we sample and the offset uh, corresponding uh, current and voltage uh, simple linear dependence and then uh, active power measurement uncertainty can be derived from the previous formula following the uncertainty propagation law which is also described in the guide of uncertainty of measurement we assume they are not correlated voltage and uh, current channels and uh, substituting previous formulas to this one we could uh, arrive to the last one and active power related uncertainty uh, is shown in this picture where we have uh, this is a uh, calculation results I will later show uh, our uh, verification with the reference instrument but in uh, uh, this step on of investigation we are mainly interested in two sources of errors like a limited number of bits sampling voltage and current and noise in of whole sensor in a current measurement circuit these are random errors they cannot be uh, eliminated by calibration process well, many others can be cal corrected by calibration but noise and whole sensor noise and quantization bits they are uh, induce random errors that <coughs> this uh, simple chart drawn by inserting various uh, number of bits 8 10 and 12 which are ordinary makes us think that increasing number of bits above 12 does not give any significant benefit because from 8 when we move to 10 the reduction of <coughs> error in uh, the whole scale of uh, measured powers is obvious but when we move from 10 to 12 the improvement it's according to theory it should be but it's much less and that means that from this point the dominance of whole sensor noise is um, uh, dominated that there is no reason then to go for a, a more resolution so higher resolution uh, options for for the reduction of these errors of course is the increase of sampling frequency because if we go back to that formula we see the sum result and in uncorrelated values are summed so it's sort of an averaging we increase per period more samples and we average more so the averaging procedure is a cure to uh, reduce error uh, random errors as well we could increase the number of fundamental periods like 50 hertz period we could accumulate more of them and also use this like a technique to reduce uh, random errors though they are for the reduction of errors but we need to pay a price for this uh, higher sampling frequency or accumulating of more and then calculating more results is uh, 
subject to increase power consumption of the power socket. It's a uh, quite often situation nowadays in the measurement field that it's not that big problem to measure more accurately, but it's about uh, how energy efficient we can do that, especially in a battery powered uh, equipment and as well in this kind of equipment where we where the goal is to measure energy but not to consume energy so the minimization of uh, energy or the achievement of predefined uh, accuracy is of key importance in today tasks this um, towards the end the power measurement verification we did also only on the active power with the reference instrument power uh, analyzer from Yokogawa. We first calibrate that uh, power socket and then uh, try to measure uh, after the calibration results and draw errors or mismatch of uh, of the readings of that power socket and the reference instrument. The calibration was done in a single point, uh, 6 amperes and 220 volts with RMS values. And we see from the picture that whenever we move to a lower range of uh, powers, the error increases and uh, it's about uh, 100 watts or even uh, 50 what we have quite a significant error which is not the case in a, in a uh, higher power consumption region we, we are nearly sure that this is because of the calibration procedure where we applied only we look only for gain factor especially because it is quite difficult to uh, stimulate 200 volts is okay but if we need uh, to derive another coefficient at least uh, a linear calibration then we need a second reference point it's not that always easy without a special transformers to have another reference point compared to 200 volt and this is the often approach in all the publications we have saw calibration is performed in one reference point but then it means that on the edges of your uh, measurement range you have uh, quite significant the increase of quite significant increase of errors uh, then i will uh, find a uh, finalize with the measurement errors several slides about power supply module which is responsible for energy efficiency of the power socket itself we were keen to find out if uh, using many components of the shelf can we at least achieve this eu eco design directives which asked at least or less than for 0.45 watts in a standby mode of uh, any uh, consumer or uh, mass production consumer device so we as you were made the requirements for ourselves that if a load consumes that power according to the standard so the power socket should consume at least not more than this it's less than this uh, uh, power and we were indeed uh, were able to find that investigated several uh, switching devices even also AC AC transformer which is not favorable uh, and uh, when we consider um, size uh, okay. but uh, that power losses in a normal operation was uh, about 100 milliwatts or a bit more with AC AC transformer and indeed it is achievable with uh, of the shelf components to achieve quite low power for the operation of this power socket itself it was mainly in a listening mode not in a sleep mode of a transceiver 
but in the listening mode was uh, uh, quite below of the standby requirements by EU Eco Design Directives. And to conclude, I once again repeat that the wireless microcontroller or system on chip which has everything needed to implement power sockets still not available on the market. It's either controller and wireless part or controller with digital signal processor for power consumption but not all three of them in a single uh, package. Then current hall sensor internal noise cause, cause errors dominated power measurement uncertainty budget when we have over 12 bit voltage and current quantization errors is and that especially in a, a low power range. Calibrating uh, or finding only uh, gain of that measurement channel of current and voltage is also uh, causing increase of errors in low power range for at least uh, offset and gain should be calibrated and switched mode power supply with power dissipation less than EU Eco Design Directives guided standby power is achievable using state of the art of AC DC converters. Several from several companies were investigated. And then thank you for listening. <laughs> if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer. I believe that uh, there are other sources of the error, like uh, frequency estimation, because you are averaging over a certain amount of the periods. And if you're assuming that the frequency is 50 hertz, and if it is not, yeah. then those errors will also occur. Yeah, um, absolutely agree. We did not target all the, we just selected several uh, um, components that influence our, uh, the errors. For to say about the frequency or the period measurement or which samples do we collect for averaging so it was ba that, that implementation was based on uh, uh, thresholding but not zero crossing but one uh, it was a well, one volt reference um, which is internal in microcontroller and when the voltage on car I think we were we did this uh, thresholding on the voltage signal when the crosses that reference level we start collecting samples and uh, when it crosses the next time we stop collecting that's why we select and of course yes there are uh, errors caused by this uh, thing absolutely what was the way of estimation of uncertainty um, did you use analog to digital converter of a microcontroller? Uh, yeah. Uh, calculations. The calculation, or yeah, it, it was done by calculating. We uh, have a formula or a measurement model. We take parameters. Uh, we change the like, uh, uh, eight bit, ten bit, twelve bit, and calculate these uncertainties with these settings about noise sensor of uh, noise level of the sensor so we actually measured that uh, noise with the rms meter uh, on the real board because it turned out quite um, a larger compared to what was given in a specification of the sensor mm -hmm. so uh, basically we have a formula we take some parameters measured from uh, a real prototype, some come from documentation, and then we calculate this. Like limiting areas? Yes. Okay, any other questions? If not, then uh, thank you for attending and questions in this session, and then I would like to conclude this. Thank you.
I think we should start uh, our session now. Uh, good news is that we have 100% of presenters which uh, are available here. So it means that one and a half hour we have 15 minutes per, per single presentation including discussion. Uh, assuming that we would like to take part in a bus trip, yeah? So, please uh, uh, try to uh, respect the time limit. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Okalma. Uh, I came from Szczecin, Northwest Poland. It's my great pleasure and honor to chair this session. I would like to invite the first presenter, uh, Mr. Miroslav Stanek from Czech Republic, who will present the paper entitled Psychological Stress Detection in Speech Using Return to op Opening Face Radius in Glottis. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> uh, well, dear audience, please welcome to my presentation. My name is Miroslav Stanek. I'm with the Department of Radio Electronics at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering at Brno University of Technology and I would like to present to you our paper oriented on speech signal processing uh, exactly named uh, Psychological Stress Detection in Speech Using Return to Opening Face Ratio in Glottis. So, estimation uh, then I'll be talking about some return to opening face ratio description and of course I will show some experimental results. Well, the speech signal processing uh, was, uh, was performed on our created database contained, uh, containing recorded uh, fluent speech under the normal mood and under real psychological stress uh, for 20, 24 different Czech native male speakers. Uh, we can divide this database into two main parts. The first part contains uh, six six speakers. Uh, for these speakers uh, was were recorded separately uh, spoken Czech vowels uh, with, with a long duration. Uh, these separately uh, spoken vowels are further used as the training training sequence and training data for further experiments. Uh, yeah, from this from uh, these separately spoken uh, vowels uh, were selected uh, some appropriate sectors from the beginning and from the center parts. Uh, well, for the global estimation, uh, we used uh, two well-known algorithms, the direct inverse filtration and the iterative and adaptive inverse filtering. Uh, so, for receiving the training data, we use the separately spoken check vowels of the length, duration, and this figure uh, shows the, uh, that the glottal shapes of, of glottal pauses uh, don't vary uh, on the duration of spoken of spoken vowels. Uh, this is the same part of uh, the Czech the Czech uh, word, and this uh, this word was uh, was spoken uh, shortly, and this word was spoken longly. Yeah, uh, as we can see. It's it more or less the same, identical. Well, each individual glottal pulse is then further processed separately. Uh, it is uh, normalized in in amplitude and in the time domain for receiving the most uniform results. Yeah, as we can see, uh, there is no difference between the shortly spoken phoneme and for the long, longly spoken phoneme. Uh, each individual pulse is divided by its speed into two main parts, the opening 
and the return face. Yeah, and for it. And in our experiments, each face is divided uh, by the first person step into observed sectors. That means the 20, 20 observed intervals uh, are used in our experiments. Uh, the zero level of each phase is uh, is exactly in the in the position of uh, the pulse maximum. Yeah, and for each phase and for each interval, the three different parameters are calculated: the kurtosis, skewness, and the area. Uh, as we can see, uh, we used return to opening phase ratio, so it means uh, these parameters calculated for the re uh, return, return part are further uh, divided by the relevant values received for the opening part defined as by this equation. Uh, this table shows an example of the five percentage interval uh, selected sector uh, at the Wobble's beginning uh, varying uh, for all check Wobble's varying on, on uh, the actual state of speakers. Well, our experimental results uh, were performed on the second database part. Uh, from the front speech, uh, where were found uh, the vowel segments, and these vowel segments are further uh, processed. Uh, optionally, optionally, they are normalized in amplitude domain for uh, receiving the possible impact of the sound normalization on uh, on the psychological stress recognition and further uh, from these uh, waveforms, the growth pulse pulses are estimated by the chosen method and uh, these pulses are, are further processed. They are normalized and filtered for rem removing so, some uh, parasitic pulses. Uh, we used in our methods, uh, in our experiments, uh, eight, eight, eight different different methods. Uh, these methods are uh, varying uh, on the selected selected uh, algorithm for uh, global pulse estimation, the direct inverse filtration, iterative and adaptive inverse filtration uh, applied on the Wobble's beginning for training data or on the Wobble's center for the training data and or on the normalized, so normalized sound or, or not. Yes, and in our experiments, uh, was our experiments was performed on six different classifiers for uh, reaching the most suitability for, uh, for precise psychological stress detection. Uh, as we can see, this is the table of uh, received results due to the total number of selected methods, of, uh, of observed intervals and of used classifiers. We received uh, 960 uh, different, different uh, efficiency results. As we can see, uh, the best results was received for supertractor machine uh, classifier applied on the five percentage interval for the iterative and adaptive inverse filtering applied on Vovo's beginning and normalized sound. Uh, this approaching approximately 96% of the success uh, psychological stress recognition. Further the Gaussian mixture, mixture model models were received uh, 
efficiency approaching the 95%. Uh, this figure illustrates the impact of the sound normalization. If, uh, that means if we use the same method uh, as the method free and we will uh, before before the global pulses estimation we will normalize the sound in its amplitude domain uh, we will receive the more stable uh, recognition results as we can see on the black line yep and finally we are at the end of my presentation so i would like to conclude it uh, this the psychological stress using the rtos can be successfully uh, recognized uh, by using the iterative and adaptive inverse filtering estimation as well as the sound normalization uh, applied on the beginning sorry for the mistakes uh, at the beginning of Vovos for receive the training data of our classifiers and the most appropriate classifier for that topic is Gaussian mixture models <coughs> and over the all classifiers uh, the biggest differences between the normal and, norm normal and the stressed speech is at the range of 50 to 80 percent selected interval. So uh, due to the performed experiments, further performed experiments, this method uh, seems to be phoneme independent independent and as well as language independent. So this method can be further expanded and applied for uh, tes testing the other, other actual emotional states of speakers or alcohol intoxication and so on. So thank you for your attention and wish you a nice day in Palanga. Thank you. So are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, how many recordings were used? And you also mentioned that it's uh, language independent. Uh, yeah. How do you know that? Uh, we tried this method at, uh, on this USAS database. Do you know SUSAS database? Stress speech under. Uh, that's, that's English. That's record. Yeah. Records pilots. Yeah. And we received uh, more than satisfied results uh, about about 86% of recognition of the stress recognition so due to this reason <laughs> we expect it it will be it will be uh, uh, language language independent we would like to we would like to apply these methods on other other emotional emotional databases like MODB for the Deutsch or, or something like that and we and our recordings uh, we record <coughs> the 20, 24 uh, different speakers yeah for each speaker uh, we we have the two different different records under the normal mood and under psychological stress, and each record is approximately uh, 30 seconds only. Okay. Are there any further questions? Maybe I will have one oh, uh, or two. <laughs> uh, do you have any initial results uh, related to female speech from the data sets uh, or not? No, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not not yet, because uh, we record we recorded uh, the real stress on our student before on our students before the final defense of their thesis, and on our department the <laughs> female <laughs> students. I <laughs> ah, know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the second question, very yeah. short. Uh, have you considered the principal component analysis for the classification? No, not no. yet. Okay. So, are there 
Any further questions? No. Well, thank you once again. And I'll, I will invite the second speaker, uh, Mr. Alex Zeleni from Slovenia. The paper written by two researchers from Austria and Slovenia entitled Multi-resolution resolution feature extraction algorithm in emotional speech recognition. So quite similar to the interest. Please present your results. So hello everybody. My name is Alex Zelenik. Today I will present uh, a paper entitled Multi-resolution feature extraction algorithm in emotional speech recognition. For an introduction, we will look at the concept of emotions and how emotional speech recordings can be obtained. That will be followed by explaining the differences between the parameters and the actual emotional speech features. Uh, next, we will carry on with the presentation of the development of theoretical procedures, um, which will focus on the concept of multi-resolution, where the use of multi-resolution windows gain a better time frequency uh, time frequency utilization of values for each feature. At the end, we'll present some comparisons on the recognition rates between the single resolution and the multi-resolution approach. So research in the field of emotions uh, is one of the most confusing and still open research areas. Uh, by rough estimation, in the, there are more than 90 different technical de definitions for emotions were created in the last 20th century. Slight vari variations in facial expressions, voice, posture soon received uh, different notions for emotions, which resulted in a long list of different emotions. So Ekman was the first uh, to define the six primary emotions that became known as the big six or basic emotions. These emotions are joy, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, and disgust. And they are generally very well accepted between scientists be because they do not contain any mixtures of other emotions. To carry out experiments, emotional, uh, emotional uh, recordings have, have to be obtained. There are three ways to get emotional recordings. So the first is spontaneous, which are gathered from real situations. The second uh, option is acted emotions, which are usually provided by professional actors in the recording studio. And the third one are the induced emotions, where we try to get the natural responses from people in a controlled environment. <coughs> For our work, we have chosen an emotional speech database that is a part of project interface, because in addition to the uh, recordings in English, French, and Spanish language, we also have recordings in Slovenian language. And uh, the emotions used here are the Ekman's Big Six emotions. So automatic emotion recognition systems rely on the quality of the chosen features extracted from segments of speech a signal of different uh, size. The white of these segments, also called processing windows, determines the ty two types of features. When features are calculated using narrow windows, uh, that span between 20 and 100 milliseconds, they are called, called short-term segmental features. Uh, to calculate using narrow windows, uh, to, to then cover the whole recording, these small segments uh, are shifted, and uh, the parameters are calculated each time until the recording is fully covered. Long-term features are calculated on the longer-term uh, intervals, usually like uh, words, phrases, sentences, even vowels, and uh, we can also use the entire recording to calculate them. From a speech recording, a lot of parameters can be calculated, but what distinguishes those values from the emotional features is that for emotional features we need values that are depending on the emotion used, and they also have to be independent from the recording duration, and from the speaker, from, from his sex, and from his age. An example of a good feature is a difference in fundamental frequency between the angry and the neutral speech, when especially in angry speech we see big differences in the, in the parameter values, while in neutral speech this is more, uh, we don't see those big differences. 
Um, emotion and speech recognition was carried out using short-term features, where the focus was on the gathering of information only for selected segments, while consciously excluding information that is based on the duration of individual elements of speech, like the duration of vocals, pauses, speech rate, and etc. In order to achieve, especially in order to achieve lower computational complexity and higher robustness of recognition. To see the operation, we will look at the recording of uh, number 10, which sounds in my language the set, by a male speaker with a duration of 950 milliseconds. Um, the whole recording is divided into overlapping windows with the window height of 64 milliseconds and the shift of 16 milliseconds. Because of this, uh, the whole duration is incremented to 3650 milliseconds. With the addition of voice activity detector, uh, detector non-speech segments are removed, which can be seen in the second picture, so that we are left with approximately 65% of the recording. The majority of uh, emotion recognition studies use features that rely on extracting information from lower frequencies. Uh, we seldom extend above 1.5 kilohertz. With that in mind, we propose a very strict removal of features that uh, in order to preserve only the most relevant segments of speech where lower frequency, uh, frequency bands prevail in the speech signal. The algorithm that provided the best results compares the amount of energy of lower frequencies to the amount of er energy of higher frequencies. If the energy is uh, significantly, significantly higher in the lower frequencies, then the frame is kept, like we see in the second picture, otherwise it is discarded which can be seen in the third picture. These carded frames must be analyzed that no useful information is discarded. So as it can be seen in the third picture, no useful information is discarded in this case. With this algorithm, only 30% of the material is retained. Uh, and everything else was discarded because that only produces noise in the results. From all windows, Features are calculated and their values are further pro processed. Uh, first procedure is the norm normalization. From the first mm -hmm. graph, okay, sorry for that. From the first graph, we see the values of fundamental frequencies that span between 30 and 500 hertz. That is uh, normalized, and we get the second graph where the average value is one. Here we have also the option of limiting limiting some values, but in this case, we don't need to do that. So from the second graph, we see a presence of two distinct peaks, which is actually, uh, which actually occurs because male and female uh, characteristic fundamental frequencies differ. So to achieve uh, the third graph, we have, to, we have to divide the values by the uh, characteristic frequencies for male and female speech. So from the third graph, we can also already see different, uh, different colors represent the values from different emotions. That some emotions already, that the center of it is positioned slightly to the right or slightly to the left and the other. So usually the fundamental frequency is one of the best ways to distinguish between uh, emotions. From <coughs> So uh, for the experiments, uh, we calculated features from uh, window widths between 16 and 2048 milliseconds. But for the border cases of 16 and 2048 milliseconds, the recognition rates uh, dropped. So because of that, we removed uh, those uh, processing window widths from further processing. From each uh, processing window, 549 potential feature features were calculated. To remove the non-beneficial ones, we used the program package called Vika and provided, uh, that provided us with a two-step approach. In the first step, we removed a lot of uh, features already with the measuring of information gain. And for the second ste uh, step, we were keeping uh, the best subset of features to distinguish between classes that usually left us with the uh, with a number of features between 25 and 50 uh, features. 
Among the selected features, we saw patterns where uh, some features were popping up more often. So these features were the fundamental frequency, then the male frequency capture coefficients, a low pass feature, which was a feature that we defined ourselves, free stimulus values, and the magnitude and energy coefficients. <coughs> From the, uh, so the main focus of the paper was in, the, in uh, selecting the best uh, processing window wide. Uh, when choosing a processing window wide, we are determining also the time frequency resolution. So with narrower windows, we get good time resolution, so this one, but bad frequency resolution. And with wider windows, we get good frequency resolution, but on the expense of uh, getting a worse time resolution of parameters. So for the, <coughs> so for the, uh, uh, for the resolution of that one, we proposed a multi-resolution, a creation of multi-resolution window. This is done by having uh, different, different uh, processing window widths on top of each other. The first option is to have three windows centrally aligned with a different size. Which one? Uh, the problem here is that when we are shifting the window, we get to different overlaps. So for the widest window, we get the correct overlap. For the uh, windows on the second level, there is no more overlap. And for the windows on the third level, we actually get empty spaces, so the information here is not processed, and which is certainly not desirable. That is why, sorry. That is why we designed a new window, where when uh, this window is being shifted, there is no more left of out information. The uh, everything is being processed twice which is nice, but the problem is here, that at the start of the recording and at the end of the recording, we get some information that is not processed. So this is just like a small percentage, but anyway, we de designed the third window, where even in the individual window, everything is processed. And we actually got, because of, maybe also because of this full coverage of the basic window, we got the best results using a multi-resolution window that looked like this. So, with the extracting a feature the, in the single resolution approach, uh, every feature generation is determined by the values of each feature window. To enable a direct performance comparison between the multi resolution window and the single resolution approach, we needed to implement multi resolution feature extraction in a comparable manner. Uh, in the multi-resolution window, the new window contains seven different windows, which are calculated over various levels. For that's why we get seven times the values of features than in single resolution mode. So for the first step, we aim to reduce the amount of uh, features on each level. This is done by calculating the average values for each level, and from then on, we just continue the same as in the single resolution approach. So firstly, by uh, implementing the calculating the information gain uh, gain parameter, and then by uh, using by assessing subsets. For the comparison, uh, we had a result from six different six different single resolution windows and two different multi resolution windows. The best the single resolution approach is represented by this curve, and uh, multi-resolution results is re represented by the columns here. So the best uh, recognition rate was in the single resolution approach was here at 84.1%, which was actually topped by both the multi-resolution approaches with 85.5% and 87.6%. Uh, so those values were achieved by the multilayer uh, perceptron. To confirm the benefits of multi-resolution approach, we also tried to use other other uh, classifiers. So we we tested a lot of them, but the best results were actually 
gathered with a random forest of visit decision trees, k nearest ne neighbor algorithm, and also with Gaussian mixture models. So these were the best uh, uh, the best uh, results for each of them, and we can see that the multi-resolution approach always gained higher recognition rates than the single resolution approach. The difference between them was 1.5% on average uh, in absolute terms, which actually presents 8.7% of, uh, of improvement in relative terms. Okay, so this was everything from my side. Have any questions? Hey. Please ask. Uh, was, uh, if uh, you are considering various algorithms, do you think about constraints that will be from performance point of view of uh, equipment that will run these algorithms? Meaning that yeah. Take a lot of windows, you process them, so I guess you increase demands upon the process of that will run this. Yeah. Uh, do you somehow so basically in the learning phase we had five hundred and forty nine parameters which is not doable like in real for real time processing. Mm -hmm. So for the even for the options that I explained here, those would not be really efficient when if we would be calculating at once. But for this one Actually, you can just once take the values and then calculate whatever uh, whatever feature we want. And for this one, we can actually take the, the same values and recalculate them again. And in the end, we are anyway calculating just like 20 to 25 features at once, not 500 or 1,500 as we do in the learning phase. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any further questions? So maybe I will ask <laughs> about some issues. Um, well, uh, you uh, you use overlapping windows. Yeah, maybe it could be faster to use just three steps of processing with windows with a, a very uh, very low size and the second question is what is the shape of the window is it re rectangular window or any other mm. shape Gaussian let me or? see so for the second question we use the Hamming window Hamming. yeah okay it's Hamming window I have it now. somewhere here for the others we try different ones, so triangular, hand okay. window, stuff like that. But this one actually provided the best uh, okay. uh, re uh, frequency response. And uh, for the first one, so we have to, um, so we we have to load the values already. And when we have them, we can already just uh, extract the the features. So that's why we didn't do it like three times. This was all yeah, done okay. in one go. And if we want, uh, want to do in real time, then it has to be done at, yeah, okay. at the same time. But uh, maybe another s very small short question. Uh, what is inside VECA? Uh, what dimensionality reduction so, uh, is inside? VECA, this was actually developed by uh, University of New Zealand. It stands for Vika to something. Uh, this is actually a really nice uh, program package for uh, for machine uh, with a lot of machine learning algorithms. Okay. We can uh, we just have to prepare some known uh, known way of how the uh, features are generated, and then we can try to use a lot of different subset evaluators. Some. Let's say we can use also a lot of this mach machine learning uh, stuff like uh, support vector machines or their multi-layer perceptron and like ADA boost, different yeah. trees. I don't know there is really support for a huge amount of different classifiers. So, uh, so we tried a lot of them and the ones and you have chosen the best. Here, yeah, okay. Are the best. Okay, so thank you once again. Well, starting from sound, we will go into ultrasound because the third paper
is entitled uh, Assessment of Ultrasound Velocity Application for Chemical Process Monitoring. Uh, the presenter will be Mr. Dobilas Leoconis from KTU, as I suppose. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. I am Dobilas Leoconis from Kaunas University of Technology. I want to present presentation about assessment of ultrasound velocity application for chemical process monitoring. Uh, uh, one of most uh, popular uh, material is uh, epoxy resin, but uh, it uh, with uh, <coughs> this material with, without hardener have a poor uh, properties. But after we uh, mixing with hardener, we can get uh, good properties, uh, solid material. Uh, this uh, uh, epoxy using for joining composites, oh, excuse me, composites manufacturing or coating and uh, other uh, other purpose. But uh, exist one problem: uh, the s uh, sample uh, or or um, or product in the mold. Uh, uh, the product from mold need uh, very uh, uh, fast remove. Uh, need uh, need to minimize uh, time uh, f uh, for the for a uh, for a curing. Uh, need minimize curing time, and uh, this time is uh, uh, have a. Uh, uh, have an influence of uh, temperature or environmental other uh, influences. Uh, exist a few methods uh, how how can uh, measuring the curing process, but uh, all of the methods uh, is a uh, contact and uh, measuring at surface of of um, of sample. Uh, the ultrasonic method uh, is uh, not contact. It uh, and uh, it uh, measuring in uh, inside the uh, inside the uh, product. Uh, the velo ultrasound velocity longitudinal uh, wave uh, is uh, re relative with uh, mechanical properties, because uh, in our uh, experiments we measuring the velocity of, of ultrasound. And uh, vel velocity uh, calculating from uh, thickness of sample and uh, uh, time of flight uh, uh, ratio. Uh, setup uh, is a uh, is this, and uh, with computer we modeling uh, need uh, signals and uh, set uh, uh, height. Uh, power supply voltages. Uh, with pulsar, we generate uh, these signals. Uh, Twitter uh, divide uh, uh, excitation signals for um, precise uh, excitation uh, time measure. Transmitted uh, transducer uh, convert electrical signals to ultrasound signals and uh, receive uh, transducer take this uh, ultrasound signals and convert uh, to electrical impulse, attenuator adjust the level of uh, of uh, uh, receive signals and acquisition system convert to discrete form. Uh, these are results of uh, curing uh, measurement in uh, uh, 50 hour, and uh, we can uh, demonstrate the three reasons of uh, curing uh, states. It's a liquid when uh, hardener and uh, an epoxy reason is mixed, uh, gelation and the uh, solid uh, phase. Uh, if we uh, take uh, equal uh, post cure at elevated temperature uh, speed uh, to 100 percent, we can uh, uh, draw a 
uh, we can get degree of Q in in percent uh, uh, scale, but uh, there is a uh, sum of um, uh, variation because we trying uh, see from where exist uh, <coughs> from where exist the uh, errors in measurements, and uh, we have uh, total uh, errors. If we, it's uh, have two components, and uh, calculating uh, uh, partial derivation uh, get uh, sensitivities for for uh, for this and this uh, uh, component in 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 our measuring uh, system. Uh, time of light random errors we can. Uh, defined by Kramer Rao law and and uh, it's uh, uh, it's uh, uh, if we uh, if get more of energy in signals excitation or received uh, we can uh, minimize this uh, errors uh, because we using uh, sum of signals and one of them is a uh, longer signals uh, the signals compressing with correlation in time domain uh, uh, where we using uh, discrete signals uh, uh, we get a sampling frequency because uh, uh, the signals we interpolate with cosine interpolation uh, in uh, ex in uh, uh, this experiment, we using three types of signals. There is a pulse, which is short in time. Uh, we have uh, a, a flat bandwidth, uh, but it's uh, uh, have a uh, little energy. Uh, next of uh, signals is a continuous wave uh, burst, and uh, the signals have a more energy, but uh, uh, the uh, frequency domain flatness is uh, very little and uh, chirp uh, spread spectrum signals it uh, uh, have uh, more energy and flatness uh, uh, frequency range and uh, with the signals we get uh, different uh, er random errors uh, we can see it's the uh, biggest uh, of errors we get with short impulse uh, and better uh, situation is wi with longer signals which have uh, more energy and uh, there is a uh, velocity variation with uh, confidence interval with 95 uh, persons confidence in interval and uh, uh, we can set uh, this uh, uh, system errors is neglected uh, for uh, all uh, all velocity evaluation uh, this variation uh, can be from temperature variation in our laboratory in day and, and night time uh, one of problem and conclusion the time of light errors are influenced by the signal energy lowest errors are for Weidemann chirp and the uh, velocity errors caused by time of light and thickness estimation can be neglected in analysis analysis setup it's a 0.1 percent and uh, future development uh, need accounting for the error source uh, temperature variation and uh, distance variation uh, from transducers uh, acoustic contact uh, variation zero offset nonlinear parameter study or uh, behavior with reinforcement uh, this uh, re uh, epoxy that's all I, I can you right. can you talk? So, please ask.
questions if you want. Yes. I was wondering if you measure this epoxy material and at the beginning it's liquid and when you put your sensor on this so after it's hard you cannot remove your sensor. Uh, the, the real contact. Uh, we using uh, uh, safety scotch on the transducer uh, but uh, uh, after uh, after after coating the transducer, we use the uh, zero time. What what is the time if if it's uh, two uh, transducer on only two transducer without uh, uh, without uh, uh, material of of, of research and. Uh, I believe the question is uh, much more simple. Yeah, uh, how you remove the transducers? Ah, <laughs> it's do you insert them in the epoxy and stay buried? Yeah. No, we we using a scotch, uh, which is a. Uh, uh, I don't. No, 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 the transducers probably at at the, at the surface of the mold. They are at the same level as the mold surface. In this yes. experiment, we we using uh, transducer uh, directly contact with uh, with uh, uh, our epoxy, but in uh, real me measurements, we can use uh, transducer on the uh, mold where where uh, will product make where where making a product because the trans uh, ultrasound can. Uh, go from mold to sample and measure sample uh, velocity. Go to next transducer, or 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 uh, in the next step we can measure uh, reflected. Mm. Might be okay. So, are there any further questions? Please. There is the vertical axis. What is what is the meaning of the vertical axis here? There is a. I missed the point. This. Yeah. There is a persons of of curet. How many persons is curet our sample? Because uh, we measure uh, velocity in our sample. When is uh, it uh, was uh, uh, heating in the sample was uh, heating, uh, and uh, uh, we take uh, uh, this point. It's a 100 percent. This this uh, material is is uh, cured and uh, elevating to 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 this. We can said there is a 18 percent cured. And once again, please, I missed the point. Also, the following point: uh, What are the main conclusions of your research? What are your your in good use in two phrases tell us the main conclusions of your research and main main findings of your research presented here. I need some points. Perhaps I need some points. So I'd like to hear the conclusion and the main main results of your research. Uh, we uh, trying measuring uh, the speed uh, with different signals and uh, researching. Uh, with which signals is a uh, minimal random errors. And by the way, uh, you have two kinds of errors. It's time of flight and errors and what are uh, And thickness measurement. So you yeah, give us uh, two, uh, two parameters, two, uh, your errors. We are using two, two parameters. Two components. Yes, two Once components. Can you, can you explain to us these two components of errors? I missed uh, One of values is uh, uh, thickness millimeter and the uh, next component is a uh, time which uh, time from uh, from uh, measuring uh, to from two transducer what time uh, what how many time need uh, ultrasound go from uh, transmitter transducer to receive a transducer and finally remark it used to be three kind of pulse, a regular pulse a, a chip and uh, best. So we using three types uh, of signals: is a short uh, pulse, 
types or you're using all the, you're using in this process all these three types of signals? Uh, we're using three types of signals uh, yes. and uh, and uh, two two types uh, mm -hmm. narrow and uh, flatness uh, chip. What's the best choice between between these three three uh, choices of, of passes? What is the best the best choice for your in our research? measurement uh, best choice is a is a chirp by the band chirp and uh, we can get uh, uh, little uh, uh, random errors there's a chirp f the black uh, line is uh, from 5 to f from 0 0.5 to 5 megahertz okay so thank you once again Now we, will, okay. now we will hear nice sound of money, as I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> because the paper is entitled Acoustic Spectrum Analysis of Genuine and Counterfeit Euro Coins will be presented by Mr. and Mrs. Alina Gavria Sieva from Estonia. Please present your research. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, my name is Alina Kavriashova, and the topic of the paper I present here is uh, acoustic spectrum analysis of Kenyan and counterfeit euro coins. The co-authors are Olaf Martens at, uh, and Raul Land from Thomas Johann Sebeck Department of Electronics uh, from Tallinn University of Technology. The agenda uh, here is presented the agenda of my presentation. The first part it is introduction, then result of the FFT carried out on the authentic euro coins, then optimization of model analysis, results of uh, fight Fourier transform based on the counterfeit euro coins, and uh, in the end, conclusion. So here I presented the uh, setup for analysis of the coin acoustic signal. It consists of the coin uh, validation block uh, with integrated microphone and uh, oscilloscope. Uh, coin under test is inserted to the shot and uh, then it drops again to the hard surface. And here is uh, presented schematically the device where number one is a uh, hard surface and number two is uh, integrated microphone. Uh, sampling rate of the oscilloscope is uh, one uh, mega sample per second, and we store uh, the signal with uh, 500 milliseconds. So, in order to reduce the uh, size of data and minimize the influence of the noise and distortion, the signal uh, is uh, decimated 10 times. Uh, here I presented um, uh, the oscillogram and spectrogram of two years figure below and uh, here is original uh, signal of the one euro and corresponding spectrogram of one euro. And uh, here we could see that uh, here are really uh, natural frequencies that we need to discover. And uh, in this figure, uh, the result of uh, fast Fourier transform based analysis is presented. Uh, here are uh, the frequencies and corresponding relative magnitudes of all authentic euro coins. And uh, as could be seen, the uh, frequencies are really located in the separate places, what make it uh, um, possible to, to separate and to recognize uh, each coin. And uh, each coin is presented in this picture in different color to simplify uh, the comparison. Uh, here is a numerical representation of the fast Fourier based spectrum analysis where only a frequency at maximum and corresponding relative magnitude of each uh, authentic euro coin is presented. 
and uh, it could be noted they are uh, the set are uh, the sets of uh, euro coins are really unique that uh, could it possible to separate coins the novel approach uh, for evaluation of acoustic signal vibration is a plan of model analysis um, Model analysis uh, allows to measure and analyze the dynamic response du during vibration. There are stability diagram and stability uh, histogram in order to extract characteristic feature of signal in, uh, in using model analysis. Uh, the number of modes or number of degree is an important input parameter of model analysis. The, um, more expensive is um, more computationally expensive is the system. Uh, the number of degrees uh, depends on the uh, on the complexity of the structure of system. For a simple system, it is uh, in the range from 40 to 65, and in our experiments, uh, the 15 was taken first, and. Uh, uh, here is presented the stability uh, diagram of two yellow coins and uh, next the stability histogram is uh, presented. In order to reduce the computational cost, several experiments uh, uh, with different input parameters uh, have been carried out and experimentally it was found that uh, the 100 samples is enough for analyzing without uh, reducing in accuracy, and here in the uh, in the stability histogram is uh, shown the frequency distribution of calculated uh, outputs, and uh, the the green line here is the uh, decision level of the occurrences. It uh, was also defined the uh, experimental way, and is, as we could see, the mm, most frequent. Uh, uh, most stable frequencies here are four, and we can see here blue dots on the places. So, in order to optimize input parameters of model analysis, uh, it was uh, decided to reduce the number of degrees until until the accuracy remains reasonable. So, experimental way, it was uh, achieved that uh, number of degrees. 20 is enough for good results. And uh, the stability diagram, the result of uh, two euro coin with uh, optimized model analysis is presented. And the figure below presents the stability histogram of uh, two euro coins with uh, optimized parameter, the decision level of which is uh, seven. And uh, here we, we can um, compare the previous figure with uh, 15 uh, degrees of freedom and uh, well, with 20 degrees of freedom. So the first three, here are more stable uh, frequencies. The three frequency is uh, enough for uh, separating the coin. Uh, in this figure is, uh, in the figure in the first figure is a stability histogram of two euro coins and the figure below presents the average of set of uh, authentic two euro coins and uh, as we can see the results are very uh, very similar and uh, the resolution is uh, 15 hertz. So similar way, uh, experiments was carried out on the all authentic euro coins, and uh, in this slide we can see the results with uh, two euro coin, one euro coin, fifteen cent, twenty, five, two, and uh, cen ten cents and one cent. And uh, as could be noted, the frequencies allocated. Uh, really in uh, different places, so the natural frequencies are different for each Eurocoin. 
Uh, here are no numerical representation of the uh, of this analysis calculated in LabVIEW. So here are presented the set of uh, frequencies which is used for coin recognition. The next part of experiments was carried out on the counterfeit euro coins from Belgium, uh, Italy and Germany. So here are three types of uh, falsifications. The, the blue signal shows the original signal of the counterfeit coins and uh, here are corresponding spectrograms. So here is the result of uh, fast Fourier transform based experiments carried out on the counterfeit uh, euro coin examples and uh, this uh, pink lines are two euro coins just for comparison. So we can see that uh, uh, frequencies are really uh, different for all euro coins and they are different from the real two euro coin. Uh, the similar way model analysis uh, has been um, mm -hmm. uh, applied to the counterfeit euro coins. Uh, the first uh, figure shows the result of uh, carried out on the uh, counterfeit example of Belgian coin. The two uh, stable frequencies uh, was discovered in the spectrum of the acoustic signal. In Italian uh, coin there was only one stable frequency and uh, uh, in the last euro coin there is no stable frequency at all under uh, such con same conditions so if we uh, if we uh, decide to um, to to make smaller uh, this uh, acquisition level uh, maybe we can find but it is uh, not interesting so, so we need to discover it. And here is just for comparison the uh, stability histogram of the uh, original uh, two euro coins. So we can compare all four graphs. And here are numerical representation. So the coin from Germany was out of range. So we couldn't uh, uh, define the stable frequency. And uh, con as con in conclusion, results of acoustic signal spectrum analysis for coin validation ensures authentic coin recognition detection of the counterfeit coins with high accuracy, uh, frequency response and model analysis uh, methods provide unique set of uh, acoustic parameters for each coin. And acoustic signal-based coin validation approach could be used as independent solution for coin validation and recognition. Uh, here I would like to add that uh, usually acoustic um, analysis uh, was used only as a complement to some, some else methodics. So this method uh, usually do does not um, implement it separately. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions about the money? <laughs> Bring us please. Uh, I'm wondering how you measure, how you op could you open the conclusions? High accuracy, what, what is meant high and what is meant accuracy? Mm. Uh, the resolution here was uh, 15 hertz and um, I think it's uh, not I think, but uh, it is enough for validation of the coin. So we can not only uh, recognize classify, but we can also validate the coin using this uh, uh, this results of experiments, and it is uh, just by accuracy, I think. Okay, I will put it in another way. Okay. Uh, how many coins were tested? Uh, do uh, you mean uh, authentic coins and? Uh, Authentic coins we have a uh, full box, different types. So the, the, a lot of experiments has been carried out. 
and uh, we have uh, three types of uh, false uh, counterfeit euro coins. And last week we, we have also visit to Estonian forest forensic system, and we um, have uh, some experiments there. So the parameters were pre known, and we just tested our equipment, and results was uh, that we. Uh, we was able to, to, to separate and to, to sell yes this, this because that is my question um, you have tested let's say 1000 coins not so much uh, yeah. or something so in order to say that you have high accuracy there are specific techniques and statistics which say that uh, I don't know whether accuracy is the right word because accuracy is but uh, there is uh, either detection rate and false alarm rate or is a specificity and sensitivity. The, my answer is uh, the 100% of uh, uh, coins under test has been evaluated uh, correctly. And what percentage of the coins was from the counterfeit? Consider it as uh, the authentic one. Yes. Zero? From authentic ones. No, no. The, the how many uh, falsificated points were considered as authentic using the same brand? There was not such a result. Zero? Uh, actually, no. Uh, in Forensic uh, Institute, uh, I asked about the, um, the coin with the highest quality. Mm -hmm. And there I had the result that it was separated it like it was uh, the result was is it is uh, authentic. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, it is uh, feedback, but it is a good result also. But uh, we take this result in a team, and uh, actually we heard the sound, and it was uh, different from real one. So maybe this uh, this uh, method need to more. Investigation. Because I see that you have set thresholds arbitrarily. And uh, setting the threshold in detection uh, problem is the essential. You take the receiver operating curve and you take the threshold from the receiver operating curve in order to have the best separation. So that's not a question for the most probably, but it's just comment. an advice yeah. of Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Other further questions, please? Uh, I would like a question. Is these frequent are these frequencies are characteristics of coins or characteristic of your uh, equipment that was used to listen to the coin? Because if you design or assemble some other tube that you put the coin in, the frequencies could be different. Uh, actually, I think yes, because it depends on uh, what equipment we are using for. Uh, or yes, like this. yes, yes, the yes. For da data storing, it doesn't depend on the distance. It uh, only we need uh, the the clear acoustic signal. Well, like material of that uh, surface that hit, that is hit by the coin is also. But important. the point is that uh, each coin has its own vibration. So if we if we start to to design some new set up for example yes maybe there will be some different uh, frequencies but they are uh, different for each point so yeah. point, point, point equipment you need to uh, repeat your test and calibrate and find out these frequencies uh, again yeah maybe it's uh, just a study investigation okay but i would like to add the comment because are you sure in your equipment does the, uh, do the coins fall always in the same way? Always I vertical? try to do it. Okay. <laughs> yes, it, it influences, of course. Yes. So it is a it is a point for for another work. So we need to make such a box for acoustic acoustic uh, system or acoustic signal uh, storing that is more repeatable. Okay. So, so we need to, to, to design the trajectory. Okay, but do you think uh, from your previous words, yeah, do you think the some parameters 
of coins would change over time after two years of using such coins could be they different or not because you, you used new, of new coins. coins yeah uh, I had different uh, different coins in my in my uh, experiments so every coin has uh, the, the yeah yeah okay. Okay. are there any further comments or questions remarks inflation if does not affect the sound yeah, okay. <laughs> so thank you once again. <laughs> now we have the fifth paper, uh, a good example of cooperation between Lithuanian and Polish researchers, five Lithuanian authors and one from Poland, so the presenter will be from Lithuania, of course. No. Uh, <laughs> please present your paper about Boost EMD an extension of EMD method and its application of for denoising of EMG signals. Good afternoon. My name is Mendogas Vasilios. I am a PhD student at Kaunas University of Technology and today I'm going to make a presentation on Boost EMD, the method which was extended by by us and its application to denoising of EMG signals. Uh, first of all, I would like to say a few words about EMG signals. EMG signal is a is physiological signal which is generated by human muscles, their movements, and it is applied in diagnostics of neuromuscular diseases, driver fatigue assessment, control of prosthetic devices, even interaction with computer software, for example, EMG-based spellers and so on. So, uh, first of all, I would like to explain the classical EMG method, how it works, and then I will explain uh, our extension. So, EMD or empiric mode decomposition is a method which allows to decompose the complex signal into a separate uh, monocomponent signals, so-called intrinsic mode functions and it is achieved by the following steps. First of all we should identify the local minimas and maximas of the signal and then perform the cubic spline interpolation between the maximas and minima and then we get two curves which is called in this case the envelopes then we have to calculate the mean of those two envelopes Calcul and next we calculate the difference between the signal and the mean of the envelopes and the remaining signal should uh, fulfill some requirements and the requirements are the signal should be equal to or differ from the number of zero crossings by one and the average of the remaining signal is should be close to zero and if those requirements are requirements are fulfilled then we can state that the the the, the remaining signal is IMF or in strict in strict mode function uh, if not then we have to then, then we have to repeat all steps that was mentioned before and if we ha if we get the IMF, the first IMF, then we have to calculate the re the residue, residue of the signal, which I which is calculated by subtracting the first IMF, and check whether it uh, is above the f the threshold value, so some specific thre threshold value, and if it's so, then we can repeat previous steps with the with the residue and extract another another IMF so second IMF third IMF till till the residue is below the threshold value that means the the composition is over and that's it so here as you can see the graphical view of the EMD and th this is the in IMFs or the monocomponent function of the signal, monocomponent functions of the signal, 
and uh, we have decomposed this for example the signal in those monocomponent signals and we can reconstruct the signal by adding all them together but what you what we can do as well we can simply discard some of the uh, monocomponent function and so get rid of the noise and it's usually uh, usually we get rid of the first IMF which contains the higher higher oscillation of the signal and but still the the critic for this method is that we cannot clearly know where is the how does how we separate the noise and the useful information so when we uh, discard some IMF we lose some information as well so what we suggest is that we should keep on extracting higher order IMF IMFs from the first order IMFs so our method called boost EMD uh, has two has three additional steps compared to the original EMD method and of course when we have the IMF and we would try to apply the original EMD method we would get, get the same IMF the same result so first of all we have to transform the signal the the first order IMF signal and the first step of decomposing uh, of transforming is to that we should decompose each IMF into pair of positive and negative semi-defined functions uh, as you can see here and then uh, step two is that we should apply the upsampling operator by a factor of two here is the upsampling operator indicated by this arrow to the top and then we can apply the EMD method and this and this process is called boosting so that's why the method uh, is called boost EMD and finally the third step is the reconstruction of higher order IMF and we can reconstruct it, reconstruct it by downsampling each part the negative one and the positive one uh, by a sample of by, by, a, by a factor of two as well and add them together so here you can see how the envelopes are obtained in the first order IMF signal so we have first order IMF signal and the those lines over here on the top and the bottom of the signal is the, is um, calculated by performing cubic plane interpolation and those two curves are called envelopes and then and this line bolded line in the middle nearly in the middle of the signal is the mean of the of two envelopes so now let's talk about the experiment we have carried out uh, we have used EMG physical action data set from the machine learning repository the data set was generated by four subjects three male one female age from 25 to 30 years each subject each subject performed 10 normal and 10 aggressive activities normal activities were bowing lapping handshaking hugging jumping and so on aggressive ones elbowing front kicking hammering headering kneeing pulling punching and so on and uh, we performed some classification uh, it was done under the assumption that the uh, that the better the noising results the better classification results so uh, the better method worked the better classification results should be and here's the results you can see that our method is here we have discarded the second order IMF, IMF 1 signal and it, the classification results of original signal using support vector machine is here the class, classical EMD which 
usually discards the IMF IMF one results is over here. So our results was better compared to those two uh, methods but still the best results of classification was using threshold IMFs uh, except maybe for clapping versus headering classification which the best result was achieved by our method and uh, but furthermore we have um, we have uh, assessed our method mm, by the noise by using some entropy and predictability met metrics uh, this uh, evaluation was done just for the noisy signal and the pred predictability based on autoregressive uh, model which has two parameters like fit and uh, random and uh, root mean square error so uh, the the error of noise signal should be as high as possible and um, the fit should be as low as possible and you can see that our method showed the best results for those two parameters and the thresholding IMF showed the best res results in entropy um, parameter but our method was not far away from from this and uh, finally we evaluate some statistic metrics like cross correlation and mutual information and uh, our method shows that showed better results than classic EMG method but still threshold IMFs show the best results but our results are also close to it uh, finally, some con conclusions. Uh, the, method, the, the method we proposed does, does not have any parameter or basis functions. It is computationally not very expensive to improve uh, performance. It is sufficient in modify the original EMD method so that only first IMF is extracted. The denoising results are superior as compared to traditional traditional first IMF discarding method, both in terms of entropy and predictability of extracted noise signal, as well as classification accuracy using the noise data. However, the thresholding based method performs better for classification. The dis disadvantage of the method is that even higher order IMFs do not separate noise components from signal components clearly therefore all noise cannot be extracted while retaining all useful information of the signal and further research will focus on analysis of spectral and non-linear properties of higher order IMFs and their practical application for important EMG domain tasks thank you for your attention Maybe you have a question. Yeah. So, are there any questions from the audience? We have time for one or two. Please, Lance. Uh, I'm wondering what was the reason for selecting that particular technique for the data extraction? Because for example, uh, in the presentation by Alina, we saw that uh, they used uh, simple spectral analysis or even modal analysis. Yeah. And uh, if you already know what pattern you should expect from the muscles or from neurons, I don't know what, what you actually register. Yeah. So Useful. Other questions? I have only a remark because there are six co-authors of the paper, but only four subjects took part in the experiments. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it was it, it was uh, a data set. Uh, yeah, okay. It it was not uh, our generated data set. We, we okay. took it from so the everything data set is library. Clear now. Okay, thank you once again. And the last but not the least presenter comes from Opole Technical University in. Poland, uh, Alexandra 
Kavalayani will present the paper related to another type of biomedical signals uh, entitled Medal of EEG Signals Pattern Recognition in Embedded Systems. Yes, Please yes, present okay. your results. Okay, so I thank you for a nice introduction. My name is Alexandra Kowalajanik, as Crystal said, from Apollo University of Technology. I will show this very short presentation schedule, so a short introduction to this study, short introduction to the BCI systems, because this is on what I'm working on, and some conducted research, future research plans, and summary. I'm not going to read it all, because I, I want us all to, you know, not miss the bus for the trip. So, analysis of all biomedical signals is quite a very challenging task, and it's because, first of all, of the nature of these signals, and I'm going to show why they are very hard to analyze. And also, because EEG signals are generated with the human brain, it makes that <coughs> uh, they're, they're, they're hard to analyze, because as we probably all know, our brain has not been fully investigated yet by the researchers. And as probably in accordance with the literature study, uh, EEG signals have become a very, very growing interest of numerous researchers all over the world, so that's why I got also some partners from various countries. And this is also because of seriously and constantly increasing development uh, of brain-computer interaction related studies. Uh, because in BCI systems, usually and mostly we apply uh, EEG signals. This is because they are able, you know, to give us information regarding brain's activity. And another key aspect of using EEG signals for the BCI systems is that the equipment is both inexpensive, quite, of course, inexpensive, well, it depends what we understand under this term, and non-invasive. Uh, the BCI systems were initially developed in order to improve their communication uh, with the external environment for handicapped users. Now we can use it also for gaming or other uh, probably less important purposes. And the communication using EEG signals is both quick and easy, and as I said also before, non-invasive. And this is because these signals present our reaction to both real and imaginary motor activity. So as I said before, the analysis of biomedical signals is quite challenging. Why is it so? I'm sorry, I'm not so great with it. Oh, you see. Uh, we can divide signals into deterministic and random signals, and EEG signals become to the group of random non-stationary signals, yes? So if someone is interested in the presentation because I don't want to prolong it, I can send it or uh, provide with it. Uh, as, as I said before, a very, very short introduction to PCI systems because this is on what I'm working on. Uh, the rapid increase of many disorders in nowadays, such as stroke, LS, or other social spinal cord injuries, strongly affects our society. And it's about 2 million people in only the United States, uh, so quite a large amount. And the result of it is growing interest in communication improvement, in, in improvement of communication methods uh, for in, in order to provide both quick, efficient and non-invasive communication with external environment. As presented here, this is quite old now, sorry, but if we pro see how many papers are being published uh, in re regards of PCI systems, this is that the, the interest is really, really constantly growing. Uh, and we can divide PCI systems into two main groups. First is non-invasive, and the second is invasive. Some researchers say that there is something like a semi-invasive semi method, but I would give it to the group of invasive systems because they require surgical intervention. And this very simplified general structure of the PCI. We've got the uh, signals being acquisite, there is a feature extraction, classification, mapping, application. Sometimes we have a kind of stimulation of the subject. There is a presentation and the user gets the information it provides and so on. If you want to make it simplified using emotive epoch headset, what I'm going to show you in a minute. We've got a user, this brain signals are being recorded. I analyze mu waves, I will say why. In a minute the signal is being processed, I have no, no filtering was done. The implemented action is the result, 
we've got some visual stimuli, not sti sound stimuli, because uh, it also affected the quality of the signal when I did some initial study before. And as I said before, we have various uh, VCI systems. Electroencephalography is non-invasive. There is no surgeon intervention. Not, nobody is being cut. No blood. No nothing. And now we've got. Uh, if we place some electrodes in the surface of the brain, we can say it's invasive or semi-invasive. I heard it does not help because probably brain does not generate any pain itself. I mean, and uh, intracortical recordings very deep into brain tissue. Uh, it's quite, uh, to be honest, invasive, but efficient. This is how it looks like. I know some drastic. This is invasive. I'm not doing it. I'm a, you know, I'm a simple uh, computer scientist. And here we've got a Mark Nagel. I'm going to tell a few words about him. This is a sample invasive electrodes just to give you a view how the brain activity can be recorded. And Mark Nagel is a guy who was uh, stopped with a knife, so he got his spinal cord injured. And uh, then he was found because he was paralyzed by the cybernetics company. And they placed some invasive, very deep into tissue electrodes, which were able to replace and some of his motor functions. Uh, what was the result? Using only his thoughts, he was able to play a simple computer game, turn on the light, uh, you know, turn, you know, channels on television, to interact somehow with the external environment. It helped him quite nicely. So we've got, as I said before, um, recording methods. So why I'm telling constantly about this? If we look at the EEG electrode, the signal has to go through all those layers, including skull, bone, and scalp. And, of course, the signal is quite weak, the um, uh, wave frequencies are quite low, so as a result, it's, uh, not the quality of the gain signal is usually not top. Uh, it's here, presented again, scalp, soft tissue, school, dura, cortex, and so on. Not a very nice thing. I used for my uh, research purpose non-invasive brain-computer reduction. Here we've got a very professional, uh, EEG speller equipment from the company Intendix. It's about 20,000 euros if you want to buy it. This one is for $200 only, and it's a gaming headset which I have ordered from America a few years ago. And what we analyze here, I show the short table with the very main brave waves uh, the frequency. I analyze mu waves. And in accordance with some literature study, some researchers said mu brave waves do not exist. This is a kind of um, significant variation of alpha waves and some people say no mu waves are separate waves what's special about them because I agree that they, they exist if we analyze brain we've got all sorts of brain waves present where mu waves only appear when the imaginary motor action is being performed so this is a sample we've got some alpha rings always artifacts because what's challenging regarding analysis of biomedical signals when it comes to the brain we have both external and internal artifacts. Inter external artifacts is like sounds, noisy environment, when something happens outside, and internal artifacts mean that our ha heart generates some artifacts. Uh, when we deconcentrate, that's what our body does, means that some internal artifacts may occur. And what's also most of the current BCI solution often quite expensive equipment, but I don't mean expensive like fMRI, but a few thousand euros or dollars have to be spent and simple inexpensive easy to buy headset emotive epoch was for my PCR system uh, implemented and one of the main aims was to find and of course to evaluate EEG based control techniques suitable for implementation in crowded noisy environment why so uh, one of my colleagues is impaired uh, he had an accident he can't move so we were thinking about making a system which would enable him to move on his wheelchair. And we decided we can't do the test in a laboratory, quite nice environment, because then if you would go with the system on the street, it would probably you know, not work if you would be killed or ridden by car. So I did many of the tests in crowded noise environments, like in sim similar to real life uh, conditions. And as I said before, we've got various EG based uh, BCI systems available on the market. Some of them contain really large amount of electrodes, like up to 250 ticks. But the complexity does not always go in hand with the proposed system's efficiency. In my point of view, sometimes less means more. So uh, I'd use only two electrodes from the Emotive Epoch headset, 
and I wanted to implement it on an embedded platform, which of course caused it caused some limitations. Uh, okay, did I do? No, in here. So this is the Motifab Pocket headset. Why did I choose it? First of all, it's non-invasive. Secondly, it's quite inexpensive, around two hundred dollars, up to five hundred with a better uh, developer developers uh, uh, SDK. Um, it's portable, it consists of 14 saline and two reference electrodes. They are placed in accordance with the 1020 system. Uh, the data is transferred via Bluetooth to the computer. The same thing great is not too great, it's quite 428 hertz, but it was fair enough. It worked for gaming, so it could work also for me. And this is one of my subjects, uh, my supervisor, but he was a very great for testing. He had no hair, almost no hair on his scalp. Perfect. So, what's important? Only signals with limited information were investigated. I did not have a professional medical equipment, and the signals were generated during the process of imagery hand movements. Uh, the system presented in this paper was based uh, on analysis of the mu waves, uh, as, uh, mu waves, as I said, which oscillate between 8 and 13 or 12 hertz, so it's quite low. And they, of course, as I said before, they reflect the response to the execution of actions. And as I said before, it's important. Imp it's sorry, possible to find them in, in imagery motor actions. Uh, the research was carried out in a real life conditions, as I said before, and simple visual <coughs> simulating application was applied. The electrodes were placed in a three and a four position. We've got here uh, just for you to compare a 1020 electrodes uh, placement system. So. Uh, emotive meets the standards. Uh, the embedded platform I used that time because the study is not very, very new and because of financial reasons I had TS7 to 260. Uh, now I would rather use Raspberry Pi as an embedded platform because it's a bit more powerful and it wasn't a real standalone application but it worked somehow. I used some um, MATLAB and so on. Uh, and what's important, the system is going to be both portable and implantable on embedded platform. We cannot use sophisticated signal processing method which require high computing power. We need to meet the limits. The embedded platform usually is quite small and uh, require possibly the least resources and processing power should be considered. It's quite important. And and because of that, we cannot use uh, you know, popular artificial intelligence-based methods or um, ev evolutionary algorithms. Or some people ask me, why don't you use like you know many statistical things? I said, I can't because if I chose my limits in embedded platforms, I have to stick to simple but efficient methods. So if you look in here, this is my method. It looks quite nice. It took me some years to make it. Uh, we've got here the analysis in time frequency and uh, sorry domain and here is in the frequency domain here you can set up which is more important and then I will explain you if we look closer and look to the question the method has a bridging property and it means that lesser sensitivity to disturbances affects the compared signals and by the normalized so it means to relate it to maximum values uh, of signal and pattern values in time and in frequency domain were, were noted. What's important? We had, you saw these two coefficients, A and B, and these are using as weighting coefficients. And what does it mean? We can use them ultimately to decide which proportion the time and the frequency components of signals and patterns should be considered uh, during the analysis. Uh, for example, if I set the value A to 0.5 both time and frequency components would be considered equally. Uh, while setting, for example, I, A to what zero, said that we would exclude the frequency component, we probably would not gather the data in that domain. So this is how it looks. Uh, well, this is the simulation uh, application. So for example, someone had to relax from first to 10 second, then imagine to move right hand, left hand. It was up to you. Uh, I did it here like this, but you could, um, the potential user could set up, we could set up experiment in the way we, we really wanted. 
And the efficiency of the pattern recognition method was quite high, around 84.7%. However, only 15 healthy. I was allowed at that time only to test healthy adult subjects to test. Now I got some, um, as we call it, um, ethics committee agreed for me to pr perform further tests in hospitals, but it was like more of pilot study. Uh, false positive and false negative results in this were, were are a big issue in pattern recognition process and almost all biomedical signals. If we've got here, we've got here false positive. We've got sample one. Uh, here is a left hand recording the f F4 electrode and we have right hand in free uh, uh, electrode movements, imagery movements of course. Of course they oscillate around similar values, but in this case they were found as being the same signals. This is quite a big issue why are the Lysic EEG signals. In this case we have both right hand imagery movements the absolute non value was 0 0.8, the signal matched, everything was fine. Not to prolong it, the proposed method of signal pattern recognition may prove its usability uh, in particular in, uh, in, in on embedded platforms implementation. And it's something that these systems are currently more powerful than it was in the past, and you know, it's developing and everything, it's getting small like mouse box. And uh, everybody wants to you know, have a small computers. So uh, the accuracy, as I said, was relatively high. And it was based on only addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. The method can be applied in any programming language, almost on any system. And of course, as every work, it raised some challenges and questions about the efficiency while using cheap EG amplifiers, such as emotive type of headset or Moose or I did some also tests or on C OCZ, but it did not work. And as I said before, using basic mathematical operations for the signal processing purposes is quite a novel approach. I have not found anything about similar in literature, but especially in area where complex sophistic uh, sophisticated signal processing methods could not be applied. And of course, uh, signals are were very noisy and sensitive. And what, is my, what are my further research plans? I want to implement other biomedical signals or data. Uh, I got some contacts with uh, a hospital where fMRI is being used, so I could do something with it. And I'm now learning and implementing a non-integer calculus-based methods also for analysis of EEG and EMG signals recently. So this is the system we are building now, emotive with some EMG and so on. And thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry that I spoke so quickly, but I did not want to prolong. And in case you have any questions, you can ask me now, or ask me later, or email me at the time. Thank you very much. <laughs> we a lot of time, but we have the time for discussion now. Are there any questions? Yes, yes. Uh, how did you calculate the frequency parameter? Is it just for the first one? Uh, I didn't do filter, I just, how was it, um, in MATLAB application I cut two frequencies. It wasn't typical filtering, but uh, on my application it's only analyzed uh, from between 8 and 12 hertz. So in order to catch uh, the new waves, mm, I know, similar to new waves, and yeah. we saw that if the subject had to think ever, like let me say, we could measure in the signal because we, we had this application, similar application setup. So I knew that after like, for example, five seconds, he was supposed to think about it moving right or left hand. So that's why it was also easier to catch compared. And uh, I did not have a database of signals. We compared each signal with each signal. It was a bit crazy, but we did not have a database. We built up one and the signal was both pattern <coughs> and signal. So. And so are there further questions or remarks? Yes. I was just wondering if uh, you apply such systems on animals, uh, but their brain activities are more simple than humans? Or, uh to be honest, I'm a computer engineer and well, uh, I don't know if someone would give me an animal for testing, but it's quite a nice hint. To be honest, I saw some uh, open source uh, data 
from coming from rats, I think. I'm not so sure where some people test their movements, but I concentrated myself that time on healthy adult human beings. <laughs> okay. Other any other remarks? I would say it's good to have such a supervisor who trusts you, but he knows that he knows it, it's <laughs> not invasive because <laughs> if it would be invasive, I wouldn't trust any young student, <laughs> for example. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, thank you once again. Thank you. <laughs> As this was the last presentation today, uh, we have 45 minutes of resting before the bus departs. Thank you.